Participation and appeal in the matter of Abby and others and entry clearance officer. Yes, Mr. Powell. My lady, um, I'm not going to make the application that is before the court to admit the transcript of the proceedings before the first tier tribunal. Upon reflection, I've decided not to trouble the court with that application. Uh, well, uh, um, I, don't, I don't think you need to worry about that because we'd already decided that we were going to uh, look at it de bene essay in any event. So we've all read it. So we've, <laughs> so we've all read it. So I'm afraid the die is cast. <laughs> So we, we, we will treat you as having made the application. Well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, unless, I'm, unless, you, unless you tell us that you don't. No, I, I withdraw what I said, and I, I do make the application, and yes. I, I would ask that the court look at it. Which we But we just thought, let's let's just no, yes. carry on. Yeah. Now, well, I, if I can just tell you, we've had an opportunity of reading the papers and dipped into the um, authorities. We are familiar. I, I noticed that we've got one all seen that we've got a substantial number of authorities. We are all um, familiar with the procedural authorities. Um, so if that's of any assistance, um, that we is are assisted for half a day. Yeah. Um, well, in that case, I mean, I would say that the, the issue in the appeal is actually a very narrow issue. It's not an issue as to whether there was procedural unfairness before the first tier tribunal. The issue is whether the unfairness that occurred was material. And although the upper tribunal characterised his decision as being a decision that there was no procedural unfairness, if one actually analyses the decision properly, it's clear that he, the tribunal found that there was procedural unfairness, but it, that it was not material. It could not have made any difference to the outcome. So I'd say that the, the central issue for the court is whether what happened before the first tier tribunal, the unfairness of that procedure was material. So with that by way of introduction, could I just take you briefly through the, the matters that you would need, I mean, the, the essentials of the case? I mean, first of all is um, the applications were for family permits sponsored by Ashkir Abdi Elmi, who is sitting here with the stripy shirt. He sponsored applications by his sister Uba Abdi Elmi, her son Maharez Sharif Hassan, and their brother Dahir Abdi Elmi. And the applications were made under the EEA regulations. I'll perhaps ask you to look quickly at those. Certainly. They are at tab one in the Fund of Authorities. So they begin at page five in the Fund of Authorities. But the actual place to start looking is at page uh, number 12, which is Regulation 12 of the Immigration European Economic Area Regulations of 2016. And Regulation 12 begins issue of EEA family permit. And if you could look down to um, paragraph 4 of Regulation 12, it says an entry clearance officer may issue an EEA family permit to an extended family member of an EEA national, the relevant EEA national who applies for one if. And then there are various conditions that need to be satisfied, but those, those don't arise here. Could I ask you then to turn back to page 7, to regulation 8, which tells you what an extended family member is. And it's Regulation 8.2. It says the condition in this paragraph is that the person is A, a relative of an EEA national, and B, residing in a country other than the United Kingdom, and is dependent upon the EEA national or is a member of the EEA national's household, and either, and it goes on to mention a couple of requirements. The key, the underlying key factual issue in this case is whether the appellants are dependent upon the EEA um, national. That's, that's the, the crucial factual issue. So the appellants applied for family permits under those regulations. Could I then take you to the decisions on the applications, starting at page 55? I hope it's page 55 in bundle A. 
This is the refusal of EEA family permit to Uber Elmi Abdi. And at the bottom of the page, there's a heading, the decision. Um, you state your brother is a Dutch national. You have provided evidence that your sponsor holds a Dutch passport. So that's apparently accepted. But then the next two bullet points go on to express the reasons that, in short, the evidence did not show that the, that the sponsor had been making sufficient remittances to establish that the appellants were dependent upon him. The remittances were too sporadic and made over too short a period of time to establish dependency. So there's no issue taken about the credibility of the sponsor or the credibility or reliability of the evidence that was relied upon. It was simply said that the evidence did not establish, it was not sufficient to establish that which needed to be established, namely that the appellant was dependent on the EEA national. So then at page 57 is the decision for Mares Sharif Hassan, that's Uba's son. And if you, one looks at the heading at the bottom of the decision, it's in the same terms, the three bullet points, as the decision in respect of his mother. And both of those decisions are dated 8th of January 2021, thereby Entry Clearance Officer JD. And then at page 59, there's the decision in respect of Dahir Elmi Abdi, which was made by a different Entry Clearance Officer on the 25th of February. That's at the bottom of page 60. And the reasons given for refusing entry clearance to him was essentially that no evidence had been provided. But the, the three cases have, have proceeded on the basis that they should all be decided in accordance with each other. And that the absence of evidence in Dahir Elmi Abdi's case was a clerical administrative issue. So that's the, those are the decisions. Um, could I then take you to could I take you please to the the skeleton argument for the appellants before the first tier tribunal, which is in bundle B. And it's it begins at page one in bundle B. Page three, I'm sorry to say. Thank you. Um, at paragraph 11, there's a heading schedule of issues. And it says, considering it cannot be disputed that the sponsor is a Dutch national, and this... Sorry, beg your pardon, could you just... Which paragraph? Did paragraph you say? 11. I have it, thank you. Considering it cannot be disputed that the sponsor is a Dutch national, and this is accepted in the reasons for refusal letters for the second and third appellants, the key issue before the tribunal is as follows whether or not it is accepted that the financial support provided by the sponsor covers the essential living needs of the appellants. So that's the understanding of the, the appellant's lawyers had of the case. Um, if one turns over a few pages, there's a schedule of all the remittances that were made by the sponsor to the appellants in Kenya, which goes on over a number of pages. And then on the last page, it's page 11 of the bundle. Paragraph 17 says the evidence above clearly demonstrates the appellant's financial dependency on the sponsor, such that the answer to the issue before the tribunal is yes, the appellants are dependent on the sponsor for their essential living needs. And so the appeal should be allowed. So that was understood by the appellants to be the sole issue for determination by the first tier tribunal. And that uh, it was understood that there was no issue as to credibility. It was really as to whether the evidence established what was what they needed to establish. Could I then take you to the first tier tribunal's decision, which is at, begins at page uh, 48 in bundle A. So looking first under the heading representation, you have for the appellant Ms. Deary, and for the respondent, no attendance. So the Secretary of State unrepresented before first-tier tribunal. Um, then, at, or, or could I ask you to go, please, to paragraph 10, 
there's the heading decision, and the judge says, I am not satisfied that Mr. Ashkir Abdi Elmi is the source of the funds either sent to or used by the appellants for their essential living needs. And then she describes the evidence that was before her about the remittances that were made and about um, Mr. Elmi's earnings. So his earnings she sets out in paragraph 11 with reference to documents in the bundle. Um, then it's she not, sets it's out. It's not earnings, is it? It's uh, taxable profit because his earnings are, are as given in his evidence. My lady, yes. I mean, it, it's his earnings from. Well, it's his taxable profits from his yes. work. As I'm a, sorry, you said earnings, but it's something rather different between the amount of money he said comes in every month from his taxi driving and taxable profit. They're two different things. Um, I, I should have said, um, before starting to take you to the judge's reasoning, that there was substantially more I evidence before the judge than had been before the entry clearance officer when the entry clearance officer made their decisions. So th there, was, there were many pages of, of documents. The, the tax return is described in paragraph 11 for... 2020 stroke 21, which is the one the judge used, uh, as something which may not be complete. Does one infer from that that it wasn't actually the submitted tax return, but was in a draft form? I, I just... Do you think that's right? My Lord, I, I think that's the position, but I can't say for certain if that's right, but that's going to be checked. Thank you. So, at paragraph 11 onwards, the, the judge summarised or, or described the evidence about the financial situation before her. Um, at paragraph 18, she compared the payments made by the sponsor to the appellants with the evidence about the total business profit and found that that would have left him with only £127 for the entire year to meet essential living expenses that he had. So essentially she found that it was simply not credible that he could be supporting the appellant. Well indeed and that's even clearer from paragraph 20 where she says um, I'm not satisfied that funds which allegedly came from the sponsor actually do come from the sponsor. So that's a straight up and down finding that the evidence is untrue. It, it, well, it's a straight up finding, yes, that the evidence, that the money comes from somewhere other than the sponsor, yes. It, it's a clear finding that what he has said is not credible. She rejects his evidence on the, the provenance of the money and, yeah. yes. The, 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 the bundle contained remittance advices, did they? some form of evidence of the remittances. Yes. Or, the, the, and I think we've been told that they had his name on as the sender. Yes. What, what, what form of remittance advice? Was it a, a was the money union receipt or something of that nature? What was it? My Lord, I'm sorry, may I just... Well, Lord, they, they were um, printouts from the internet, which um, was the means by which the, the company um, documented the, the transactions. And the printouts would have had the appellant's, uh, sorry, the sponsor's name, the amount of money remitted, um, the name of the person to whom the money was being remitted. And it, it, was, an it was an online process and it was um, documents printed from the internet that evidenced those remittances. So they had his name on as being the sender of the money. And the... Mr Skinner, would you object if we 
saw examples of those. They, they were in the bundle before. I wouldn't, the first I'm not sure if they are in the bundle. They're not in our bundles, but they were in the bundles before the first tier. No, I, do they were, I, I don't have any objection to that. Thank you. Well, perhaps um, we could be given an example or two of that. Can we, I'm, no, we can certainly provide examples of those. Um, yes, I don't mean the whole lot. Just, I'd just like to see the form that they're in. And uh, would that be okay to do that after the hearing? Or, yeah. Yes, that's um, I mean, in the in the table that you that is set out in the the judge's determination, um, she gives page references A, B, twenty nine, and so on, which are references to the appellant's bundle where one would find those documents. So the appeal was dismissed. The the, the, the appellant's case was dismissed on an entirely different basis to the basis upon which their applications for family permits were rejected by the entry clearance officer. So then there was an application for permission to appeal to the upper tribunal. Um, permission to appeal was granted. I should pre permission to appeal was granted and the upper tribunal heard the appeal. Its decision begins at page 28 in bundle A. So the tribunal says at paragraph five, under the heading, the decision of the first tier tribunal, the respondent was not represented at the hearing before the first tier tribunal, which in this case, as in many in which the situation arises, was unhelpful and at least in part led to one of the grounds of challenge against the judge's decision. Then going to paragraph 10, you have the, the, the submissions made um, by Ms. Deary for the appellants. She relied on the grounds of appeal, expanding on them in an appropriate manner. She submitted that in the absence of a presenting officer, the judge should have at least raised a concern about the sponsor's ability to have sent funds to the appellants at the hearing itself before reaching an adverse decision on the issue. So that was her submission on the primary ground. Um, then at paragraph 11, there's the submissions for Ms. Willett Briscoe, who was the presenting officer representing the Home Office. She submitted that the judge's decision was sustainable. He had undertaken an assessment of the evidence as a whole, including the figures relied on by the appellants themselves, and carried on to say it was a conclusion the judge was entitled to make. I mean, I would say that it's very important to note what um, she does not appear to have argued for the Secretary of State. So, first of all, she did not argue that in fact, the first tier tribunal had put the point to the appellants and given them notice of what she was thinking. And the Secretary of State could have looked at the transcript of the hearing that she did not attend and taken a view as to whether that point could or could not have been made. But the point I'm making now is that that was not a submission made by the Secretary of State. Secondly, the Secretary of State, the presenting officer, did not argue that the point about procedural fairness before the first tier tribunal was not a point open to the appellants, owing to the want of evidence of what had happened before the first tier tribunal. That is the point which is now taken in the respondent's notice, but it's not a point which was taken before the upper tribunal. And if there was merit in the point, I would say it's one that could and should. But the second point follows from the first, doesn't it? Because there wouldn't be no need for any evidence unless the point was in dispute. But as you pointed out, it wasn't in dispute because it wasn't suggested by Ms. Wilcox Briscoe that the point had ever been put to the witness. I'd, I'd say that. I, that so, I so the one leads to the other. I would say that the one leads to the other. I think that the way that the Secretary of State may, may put the case is that that was neither conceded nor opposed by the Secretary of State. So it was a matter that the upper tribunal needed to make a finding about. The upper tribunal needed to decide what happened before the upper tri before it the first year. wasn't in dispute. That's, that, that's the point you make, first of all. It wasn't in dispute. That, that would be my primary point. It's, yeah. it's just not disputed. Yeah. 
it was also not argued for the Secretary of State that the point is one that did not need to have been put by the first tier tribunal because it was a point that should have been obvious to the appellants and therefore the appellants can be taken to have made a forensic choice to try to sweep the point under the carpet and hope it wouldn't be noticed by the first tier tribunal judge. And the cases about um, procedural fairness in, in this context do indicate that in certain circumstances the, the judge is not obliged to give notice of an obvious point. If it is obvious, um, it would not be procedurally unfair not to give notice. But that submission is, as far as I'm concerned, less obviously derived from the record of the argument of paragraph 11. There weren't any skeleton arguments, I understand. There was nothing put in in writing. That's correct. All the information we have about what Ms. Willis Briscoe said has to come from how it's recorded in, in the upper tribunal decision. I understand entirely why you say the first two points uh, are to be inferred. But uh, do, do we get out of paragraph 11 that she can't have argued that it wasn't a point that needed to be put. I would say that one can see nothing in paragraph 11 that would suggest that her submission was that the point was an obvious point and therefore the first tier judge need not have put the point to the appellant. I would say that there's nothing in paragraph 11 that suggests that that is how she put the case. But I would say more importantly, in any event, the upper tribunal decided in the appellant's favour on this part of the case, which is that it's a, it's a point which was not raised by the first tier tribunal, but should have been raised by the first tier tribunal. And one gets that from, first of all, paragraph 16 of the upper tribunal's decision. My provisional view had been that the fairness challenge had some merit to it. I accept that the respondent's refusal letters did not expressly dispute the fact that the sponsor had sent funds to the appellants. Further, in the absence of a presenting officer, judges must act with some caution before appearing to take points against a party which have not been raised previously or at a hearing. In the present case, I conclude that it would have been much better if the judge had specifically raised at the hearing any concern with the sponsor's ability to remit funds. So first of all, I would say that that is a clear finding by the upper tribunal that the point was not raised before the first tier tribunal. And secondly, I would say it's a clear finding that it was not a point of a kind which was so obvious that it did not need to have been raised. And I would say that that becomes even clearer when one reads on at paragraph 18, the judge, the, the judge says that in all the circumstances, I conclude that there was no procedural unfairness on the judge's part, such that his decision as a whole should be set aside. My reasons for this are as follows. And just before coming on to what the judge's reasonings, reasons are, the important one of those reasons is not that the, that the point was so obvious that it need not have been put. The judge's reasons are, um, paragraph 19, satisfied there was more evidence provided in the course of the appellate proceedings than had been submitted with the family permit applications. Thus, there was additional evidence for the judge to consider which had not been before the original decision maker. Then he summarises the judge's findings about the financial position and the implausibility of being able to send that much money with leaving only £127. And in the last sentence, in paragraph 20, says the judge's consequent finding that the sponsor was not the source of remitted funds was one which was clearly open to him on the evidence. And then at 21, the question then arises, what if the judge's concern had indeed been raised at the hearing? It has been accepted that there was no other evidence before the judge which disclosed any additional sources of income for the sponsor. Indeed, it is also accepted that there were in fact no other sources of income for him at the time. In my judgment, it follows that 
even if the judge had raised the issue by way of an indication to counsel or through questions of his own put to the sponsor, there was nothing by way of material evidence that could have been provided to alter the calculation arrived at or the conclusion drawn therefrom. So I would say that that is that shows that the upper tribunal, although describing the conclusion as being one of no procedural unfairness, in fact, the conclusion is one that procedural unfairness was not material because there is nothing that the appellants could have said had the point been raised before the in the first tier tribunal. Nothing they could have said that would have led to a different conclusion. Um, and that is again clear from paragraph 23. In all the circumstances of this case, I conclude that there was no procedural unfairness on the judge's part. Even if there was, by virtue of a failure to raise an issue at the hearing, it could not have made a material difference in the outcome. Um, that is the finding that um, Lady Justice Carr identified primarily in the grant of permission to appeal, that that was arguably wrong. And I would say that it was not just arguably wrong, it was wrong, that that is not a finding that the judge could properly make. But in any event, now that you've got permission to appeal, the question for this court is whether the FTT erred. I mean, of course, technically, you're appealing from the UT, um, and it's, we always pay attention to what the UT has said and give it the appropriate weight. Uh, but if the FTT, uh, uh, in fact, acted in a manner that was procedurally unfair, then we will so decide, uh, regardless of what the UT's opinion might have been. Well, yes. So in that case, I will... But the focus in this court is always on whether there was an, actually an error in the FTT decision. Well, I would say that, um, that you should conclude that there was an error in the FTT decision if, unless, you, unless you are satisfied that um, it could have made no possible difference to the outcome before the FTT had she put the point to the um, appellants. Um, could I ask you, just before going on to the, to try to answer that question, could I take you to the case of SH Afghanistan, which I say is where one gets the, the test from. It is in tab 10 of the Bundle of Authorities, page 139 it begins at. And this is a case, it was an appeal in an asylum case to the first tier tribunal where the critical issue in the case was whether the appellant was or was not a child. He'd been found by the Home Office not to be a child, but if he was a child, if he in fact was a child, then there was, he was likely to be at risk of being persecuted in Afghanistan. And at the hearing before the first tier tribunal, he sought an adjournment of the hearing before the first tier tribunal because he wanted to produce an independent social workers report, which he said would provide important evidence corroborative of his claim to have been a child at the material times. And the first tier tribunal refused to adjourn to enable him to produce the social workers report and went ahead with the evidence that was before the first tier tribunal and dismissed the appeal. So he appealed to the upper tribunal on the ground that it was procedurally unfair for the first tier tribunal to have refused the adjournment application. And could I take you please to paragraph 15 of the judgment of Lord Justice Moses? Yeah, one well, of those familiar words of Mr Justice McGarry, yes. That's so what I, eloquently put. That's, those are the words that I wanted to highlight, but also um, the test which was which one sees about halfway down the first part of paragraph 15. Pointless unless, because the result would inevitably have been the same. Yes, yeah. yeah. 
And so I say that that cannot, have, that cannot be said of the case before the first tier tribunal, that it would inevitably have been the same had she raised with the appellant the issue which resulted in her deciding the appeal against him. Um, first of all, the sponsor's instructions are that had the point been put to him, he would have said that not only was his rent paid, not only did he live rent free with his sister, but his sister met all of his essential living needs. She fed him the bills, heating expenses and so on. They, they were all paid for by her. So she met all of his needs, enabling him to send all of his profits bar £127 to the siblings and the nephew in Kenya. So that's the first point. I'd say perhaps more importantly is what the sec something that the Secretary of State says in um, the, skeleton <coughs> argument, the skeleton argument. Could I take you to paragraph 39 of the Secretary of State's skeleton? So at the, top, well, at the top of the page, um, paragraph 34, on the assumption that the first tier tribunal did not in fact put its concerns, the respondent submits that not doing so was not procedurally unfair for the following six reasons. And then 39 is fifth. As the upper tribunal held, the first tier judge raising the issue could not have made any difference. As the appellants accepted before the upper tribunal, the sponsor has no other source of income. Absent positive evidence to the contrary, of which there was none before the first tier tribunal, and none sought to be adduced on appeal to the upper tribunal, there is no other realistic inference to be drawn other than that the sponsor was in effect a conduit for others' money, whether directly or by being provided for in kind by others, freeing up the money he earned to send to the appellants, and that any support provided to the appellants is accordingly not the support from him. No alternative has been suggested. So here, the Secretary of State is acknowledging that the very case which on instructions I say the sponsor would have advanced had, he been, had this been put to him, um, the Secretary of State's own case is that it's a realistic inference to be drawn that the appellant was being, the sponsor was being provided for in kind by others, enabling him then to send his money. Um, so that, I would say, is a material difference that could have been made if the point had been put. And I would say also that um, it would have been quite a proper way to satisfy the EEA regulations if the sponsor was sending money that he was able to send because he was supported by other members of his family. And I say that... Um, if I could take you to a couple of authorities to support that um, argument. First of all, could I take you to the case of Gia in the bundle of authorities? It's at tab 20, page 393. And it's what I'd like you to look at is at page 425. It's paragraph 35 in the court's judgment. It says, according to the case law of the Court of Justice, the status of dependent family member is the result of a factual situation characterised by the fact that material support for the family member is provided by the community national who has exercised his right of free movement or by his spouse. Um, in fact, the regulation that we're concerned with requires that the support is provided by the community national. 
It doesn't say that it may also be provided by his spouse. But I would say that um, support provided by the sponsor that he is enabled to provide because he in turn is supported by other members of his family, that would fall within that um, characterization of dependency, the purposes of um, EU law. And it's important also to look at paragraph 36 of GEA. Um, three, four lines into the paragraph. It says, according to the court, there is no good, there is no need to determine the reasons for recourse to that support or to raise the question whether the person concerned is able to support himself by taking up paid employment. That interpretation is dictated in particular by the principle according to which the provisions establishing the free movement of workers which constitute one of the foundations of the community must be construed broadly. I'm sorry, what I ask you to take from that is that the community law provision must be construed broadly. So that if there is a narrow and a broad definition that might be given to dependent, then one should take the broad definition. And if it's necessary to say that being enabled to provide support because one in turn is being supported by others requires a broad meaning to be given to dependent, then I would say that is the meaning that can and should be given. I would then like to take you to the case of Mahad against an entry clearance officer. Do we need also to note paragraph 43? Dependent on their means, members of the family, the community, national establishment, another member state, the community need the material support of that community national in order to meet their essential needs. That's, that's, that's the test. That's the is. paragraph I drew to the courts, uh, that, that sidebarring is from me, and it, the point that I was making there is just that it's of that community national. That's, that's the point that I derived from that paragraph. Yes, but it, it repeats the, the mm. test we've seen in paragraph 35. Yeah, that's material support for essential needs. But I think for the Secretary of State's case, it, it, it highlights that the support must be the support of the community national. So I think the Secretary of State's case is that you cannot demonstrate support by the community national if the only reason that the community national is able to provide that support is that he in turn is supported by others. But I would say, with reference back to paragraph um, 36 and the requirement to construe provisions broadly, that a broad construction of dependence would include dependence on money provided by the community national from his profits, but which he requires the support of others to be able to provide. On the simple basis that it's his money. It's his money, yes. His money that he can do with as he wishes and he chooses with his money to send it to support his siblings and his nephew. Yeah. So it, it is support by the community national. I would pray in a... It slightly ties into your ground too about accommodation, which is, a, a comment in his case, would have been, you say, had it been put to him, that his accommodation was all found. I mean, to be... I mean, unfortunately, the, the way that the evidence was put to the first-tier tribunal, it focused only on Cat. the fact that he was accommodated rent-free. Yes. It did not go into the issue of... Um, it was all found or not. In other words, that his, his free accommodation included bills and... Sadly, the evidence did not address that point, whether it was accommodation plus living expenses. And I have to, I have to accept that the evidence was only, in, in express terms, um, accommodation. I want to pray in aid, um, Mahad, which is tab five in the bundle of authorities. And it's a case concerned with the interpretation of the immigration rules. It's not concerned with the interpretation of um, the EEA regulations. But I would say it is dealing with um, a provision which is so closely related to the EEA regulations, both in terms of the language and also in terms of the, the purpose of the provision, that the principles identified in Mahad should apply equally to um, the, the scenario that, that we're talking about.
So could I ask you to turn first, please, to page 51 in the bundle of authorities? It's, um, it's paragraph three in Lord Brown's judgment. We're just before paragraph four. He sets out um, the relevant rule. It's rule 317, um, headed other dependent relatives. And subparagraph three of rule 317 says, um, and this is talking about the applicant for entry clearance, that the applicant is financially wholly or mainly dependent on the relative present and settled in the United Kingdom. So I'd say that that is not materially different to the provision that's in, in issue here, um, the EEA regulation. So one of the questions before the court was whether... Um, an appellant could satisfy that rule if the money that he was being sent by his son was sending him money. The money that his son was sending to him was money that was regularly given to the son by a family friend in order that the son could then send it on to his father. So it wasn't even money that the son had earned. It was simply a gift given to the son, which the son forwarded on to the father. And the case for the Secretary of State was that that showed that the person in seeking entry clearance was not dependent on the son. He was dependent on the person who was giving the money to. And so what the Supreme Court decided there, could I ask you to go to page, first of all, to paragraph 47. I'm sorry, not paragraph 47. Um, Paragraph 34, which sets out the, con the, the facts of VS's case, which are what I've just sort of broadly described, that he was receiving £100 a month. The applicant was, the applicant was receiving £100 a month. The source of that money has been Mr Arunan. Mr Arunan has provided the money to the sponsor who has sent it to his father. Then... Lord Brown answers the question whether that establishes dependence on the, the son in paragraph 36 um, about two-thirds of the way between letter D and E. He says, I am now satisfied, however, that by the same token that the principal maintenance requirements are indifferent, save as to verification and reliability, as to the source of the funds which are going to maintain the applicant after arrival, so too rule, rule 317.3 is indifferent as to the source of the funds supporting the relative abroad, provided only that he receives them because of his settled relative here. Indeed, the relative abroad might well know nothing of the actual source of the funds, being aware only that they are sent regularly by the relative here. I would say that that phrase is indifferent as to the source of the funds applies equally to the EEA regulations with which we are concerned. Could I ask you then, please, to go to um, paragraph 56, which is Lord Kerr's judgment, on the construction to be placed on Rule 317.3. I am again in entire agreement with Lord Brown. This rule specifies that the person seeking indefinite leave to enter must be financially dependent on the relative present and settled in the United Kingdom. Does that mean that the UK resident must be in position to meet the dependency of his relative from his own resources, or does it merely mean that the financial dependency exists? In my view, the latter interpretation is plainly to be preferred. The import of the rule is to require that the UK resident should have the capacity to sustain his relative's dependency but there is nothing in its language that prohibits the funds from which he is able to do so coming from an external source. Financial dependency for the purposes of the rule is established by the fact of payment by the resident relative. It is not displaced from that condition simply because the money for the payment comes from a different source. And I would say that reasoning applies with equal force to the EEA regulation upon which the appellants were relying here. That the regulation is indifferent to the source of the money. The source of the money is the sponsor. And not only as in VS's case is he the source in the sense that he was sending the money, he's the person sending it, but also 
it was his own money to do with as he wished. And what he wished to do with it was to send it to his family. So I would say on that basis that it was a material um, unfairness by the first tier judge in failing to put that point or that case to the um, appellant because the appellant clearly had at least an arguable response to it. The Secretary of State accepts that the inference to be drawn is that he was being supported by the family that enabled him to send all his money. And on these authorities, it's at the very least arguable that that would suffice for the purpose of the rule. The point that I was going to go on to next is the question of whether it was open, whether this was open to the upper tribunal to um, decide, given on the Secretary of State's case there was no evidence before the upper tribunal of the alleged unfairness. So I, I could go on to um, preempt the Secretary of State's argument on that case now, or I could wait and deal with it in reply, which... Yeah, no, let's deal with it all in a piece. And carry on. Yes, please. Well, <clears throat> the first, my first response to the respondent's notice would be to say that um, the court should not entertain the argument. It's an argument that could have been taken before the upper tribunal. It's an argument which, if it had any merit, it should have been taken before the upper tribunal. And it's too late now for the Secretary of State to be troubling the court with that argument. I would also say that it's relevant on this point that had the argument been raised before the upper tribunal, then proceedings before the upper tribunal may well have unfolded in quite a different way. If the point had been raised before the upper tribunal, then there is every likelihood that Ms Deary would have asked the upper tribunal to adjourn the hearing so that she could obtain the transcript of the hearing before the first tier tribunal or so that she could have made a witness statement about what was said and what was not said before the first tier tribunal and she could have asked somebody else to represent the appellants before the upper tribunal. Well, we maybe jump in two, st two yes, steps exactly. <laughs> The first thing that would have happened, if, if uh, the Home Office representative had said, wait a moment, I don't accept <coughs> that this point wasn't put. Uh, the first thing that would, would, would have happened is, it, but because I haven't got any evidence about it, is that Mysteri would have said, well, I was there, and I can tell you that it wasn't. And then the Home Office representative would have been asked, well, do you still wish to dispute it? Uh, or are you happy to accept Mysteri's word for it? That's stage one. So it doesn't, it doesn't follow that even if it had been initially treated as something on which there was an absence of evidence raised, that would necessarily have been the position going forward. Then stage two is that which you've identified. If it had been maintained, then steps would have been taken to address it. Well, Lord, yes. I mean, that... I mean, realistically, it might well not have got any further than stage one. It might well not have done. I mean, hopefully that's, that would have been the, the conclusion of it. And one would have hoped if it was going to be taken as a point, it would have been raised in a skeleton argument rather than um, on the morning of the hearing. Yes, my lady. Uh, yeah. But if um, if that's wrong and if you are if you are persuaded to entertain the argument, I would say that it's an argument which has got no merit and should be rejected on the merits. Um, I would say that there there was evidence before the first before the upper tribunal, even with that, with Mr. even. If Ms Deary had said nothing to the upper tribunal about what happened before the first tier tribunal, there was sufficient evidence to entitle the upper tribunal to reach the conclusions that he did in fact reach. So, first of all, there was... <clears throat> there was the evidence of the decisions, the entry clearance officer's decisions that were being appealed against and showed... <clears throat> 
those showed what the case being put for the Secretary of State was. Secondly, there was the appellant's skeleton argument, Ms Dewey's skeleton argument before the first tier tribunal, which showed how the appellants and Ms Dewey understood the case. And thirdly, and most importantly, there was the first tier tribunal's determination, which plainly is, I would say, the first place to look for evidence of what happened before the first tier tribunal. And I would like to take you back to the first tier tribunal's decision. page 48 in the in bundle a <clears throat> so looking first at paragraph 3 under the heading the evidence uh, mr ashke abdi elmi had made the two witness statements statements the latest of which was contained in a supplementary bundle and dated the 18th of february 2022 Ms. Deary and I asked him some questions, the full detail of which are set out in the recording of the proceedings. A brief summary of his evidence is set out below. And then you can see numbered paragraphs. And I would say that strikingly absent from those numbered paragraphs is any evidence at all about how the sponsor meet, meets or rather met his essential living expenses, which is what the, the judge called them in, in her paragraph 18. And the summary of his evidence makes no reference to his evidence in response to the question, after sending the money you claim to send to, the, to Kenya, you are left with £127 per year. How then do you meet your living expenses? There is no evidence of how he answered that question. And I would say that given that that was the crux of the first tier judge's reasoning and the fundamental, the basis of her, her case against the appellant, if that question had been put to the sponsor, one would have seen his answer to that question in her summary of the evidence. Because although it's only a summary, one would expect to see there the key pieces of evidence upon which she relied. And it's for that reason that I sent, I asked the court to look at KV Sri Lanka. Which is a case um, before the Supreme Court about where there was a dispute over what the medical evidence showed about somebody who had been tortured or claimed to have been tortured and the, the relevant passage is at page paragraph 29 that there was a dispute about whether it was suggested in the court of appeal by Lord Justice Sales that the medical experts in their evidence before oral evidence before the upper tribunal must have said something different to what they were recorded as having said in the upper tribunal's decision and the court, about four, five lines in, Lord Justice Sales observed that KV had failed to provide the court with a transcript of the doctor's oral evidence and that without a transcript, there was no basis for criticising the tribunal. But it is dangerous for us who work in appeal courts to assume that the answer to an apparent mistake at first instance must lie in oral evidence not recorded in the judgment and not transcribed for the purposes of the appeal. The court of first instance should be expected to record the oral evidence on which it places reliance. So I would say that on that authority, if the first tier tribunal had heard evidence from the sponsor in response to the question, how do you manage when you're left with only £127 in a year? One could expect the first tier tribunal to have recorded that. And I would say that the completely irresistible inference to be drawn from the absence of any reference to an attempt by the appellant to answer that uh, the sponsor no reference to an attempt by the sponsor to answer that question is that the question simply was not put so 
I would say that on that basis, there was evidence before the upper tribunal that the case had not been put to the sponsor or to the appellants, and the upper tribunal was entitled to find that there was therefore unfairness, albeit on the upper tribunal finding not material. And it is evidence which I would say entitles this court to the conclusion that the case was not put to the sponsor. There's just one further authority I'd like to take you to on, on this subject, which is um, BW. It's at tab 16 in the bundle of authorities. It's a decision by um, Mr Justice McCluskey, the President of the Upper Tribunal. Um, there's an italicised headnote. Um, uh, number, paragraph 2 of the headnote, it says, In certain circumstances likely to be rare, evidence presented to the Upper Tribunal may include a witness statement compiled by a representative involved in the hearing before the first tier tribunal. In practice, this is most likely to occur in cases where such evidence is considered necessary to demonstrate that the appellant was deprived of his right to a fair hearing at first instance. Three, evidence of this kind will not be required if the determination of the first tier tribunal speaks for itself on the relevant issue. But also, presumably, it's not required if there's a transcript or, yes. or there's a concession. Yes. It's probably just worth pointing out that when this judgment was handed down, the first tier tribunal wasn't recorded. Right. Um, so it was in that context. It is now recorded. Hence That's very helpful to know. Thank you. But I would say that, um, that this is a case where the first tier tribunal's determination spoke for itself on this issue. So that is what I would wish to say by way of response to the, the respondent's notice. Um, the other ground of appeal is one that I, I don't intend to say anything further than is in our skeleton argument, which is that um, even if the judge fairly and reasonably reached the conclusion that she did, that he could not have been sending um, so much money that he was left with only £127 a year, the question was still before her and still required to be answered. Was he su sending sufficient to meet a sufficient part of their essential living needs that the requirement of the EEA regulations was satisfied? So those, those are my submissions, unless... Thank you very much, that's very clear. Uh, yes, Mr Skinner. Before I begin, might I just take a cup from the front row? Because I managed not may. to bring that back. Please help yourself. Clear, I may need some water at some point. Thank you. Um, Subject to the court wishing me to do differently, I propose to structure these submissions um, in five topics, really, and I, some of them are very brief indeed, so I don't want the court to be alarmed by the number. <laughs> um, the first one I want to touch on is the overall legal framework that applies to applications of this nature, um, and you'll have already picked up, I'm sure, that the, the, the question of who somebody has to be dependent on is uh, of central importance, and I just want to make good that point. Um, the second topic is is the Ladin Marshall application to adduce the evidence. I've heard what the court said about that. Uh, I'm going to take that very briefly indeed. But it's not it's a Ladin Marshall case, is it? Because it's a transcript. It's a recording. Uh, well, it's it's a Ladin Marshall case because it it would have, if this were an appeal from the first tier tribunal, then I would agree entirely with that. But the it is evidence that was that of. of which needed, on our case, uh, needed to be considered by the upper tribunal, wasn't put before the upper tribunal to make a fact find, a Supreme finding fact on it. don't seem to have treated the transcript in the KV case in that way. Uh, they, they may not have done, but the I don't know whether that was disputed in, in that case. I would need to double check that. You wish that. to argue it? Well, I, I just want to deal with it briefly. Um, and the, the reason I do this is because the I'm going to take the court to an authority just on the proper process. 
to be followed uh, by an appellant who wishes in the upper tribunal to suggest that there's been unfairness or bias or any other impropriety in the first tier tribunal. The, the procedure to be followed is, in my submission, well established. It's been well established for... But, but this isn't a question of, of bias or anything like that. This is a question of what happened before the first tier tribunal. Was a question asked or was it not asked? And there's a transcript which reveals unambiguously the answer to that question. I hear all of these points and I'm going to address them. I just, at this point, I'm just trying to lay out my structure. Um, I, I, I hear them and I'm going to, you'll, you'll hear my, you may not agree with them, but you'll have my submissions yeah, I'm on I'm sorry, them. you should, I should let you continue. No, no, I, 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 and I understand, I, I do understand where the court's coming from on this. The, but the, the, the proper process to be followed in the upper tribunal, the court will appreciate is a point of some significance to the Home Secretary. Um, and it, I'll take you to the authority where the upper tribunal has for the last 20 years said for an application for permission to appeal, let alone at the appeal stage, uh, an appellant is expected where they are saying that something did or didn't happen before the first tri tier tribunal to put in evidence as to what happened. When I say bias, I, I don't mean bias in the sense that the judge had some pecuniary interest in the case or uh, what I'm talking about is what normally gets alleged in this context is the judge was overly interfering at the hearing or expressed a provisional opinion which in fact wasn't provisional. And so again, it depends on what happened at the, at, before the first tier tribunal. So that that's the context of that. I, I, I'm going to deal with this in a light touch way and uh, I, I have heard what the court has said already. Three. The, the, the third topic is the respondent's notice point. It seems to me that this comes logically before the first ground. And I say that because if I'm right that the appellant needs evidence to show what happened, you can't decide whether something was fair until you've decided what the facts were. So I'm going to deal with that at first. Um, and then my fourth and fifth points are grounds one and ground two, respectively. Yes, so that's very helpful. Thank you. Dealing first with the legal framework, my learned friend's already taken the court to the regulations themselves, and you'll see that it, the regulation eight, which is obviously the domestic transposition of the citizenship directive, provides that the, the relevant appellant or applicant has to be dependent upon the EEA national. The citizenship directive isn't in the bundle, but I'm sure it's not in dispute that that reflects the language of article 32A of the, the directive, which uses the same language. Now, that definition has been considered in a number of cases, but not from the position of the person sending the money. Generally, the cases are, uh, as my own friend pointed to, about what dependence means from the position of the, pers the person in the third country. So are they dependent if they could go and get employment but choose not to, and instead to rely on the, the funds sent by the EEA national? Uh, and the, the point about it being interpreted broadly which my own friend made, is in that context. Um, and it, it, my submission will be that it's, it's tolerably clear that the money, the, so, the source of the money does have to be the EEA national. And that's clear in my submission, both from the authority of GIA, which you've already been taken to, but I'll go back to it if I may, just to make, make the point good, and also from a matter of first principle. And if I can just deal with the point of first principle, because I think it, it's important for the court to appreciate um, the the context of an EEA application to be a dependent relative, as opposed to an immigration rules application to be a dependent relative. In order to be an e, in order to make good an EEA application, one has to be a dependent on an EEA national exercising treaty rights, to use the, the common shorthand, in another EEA member state. Why is that? Because EU law has no purchase on the wholly internal situation where you have a British national in the UK who wants to bring, a, we're talking pre-Brexit here of course, but or a French national in France who hasn't ever exercised their treaty rights, who wishes to bring a third country national who is dependent on them to their country of nationality. EU law has no application in that context at all because it's a wholly internal situation, no cross-border element. And in those circumstances, the the, court, the recourse that somebody has is to the provisions set out in the immigration rules, not to an EEA application. Now, there are rules about dependent relatives in the immigration rules. If a British national, for example, wants to bring somebody that's dependent to them, then they can make that application. But what you can't do 
is for a British national to, I, I should say that the requirements in the immigration rules are harder than they are under the relevant EEA provisions. At, at, but, so what you can't do is avoid those provisions by funneling funds from British nationals or other non-EEA nationals through an EEA national in order to try to acquire some EEA right of residence when EU law wouldn't, or EEA law, uh, however one wants to put it, wouldn't have any bite at all. So that's that's the sort of first principles point. My fault. I'm afraid you've taken that too quickly. I, I'm very sorry, my lord. So e EU law doesn't apply to a wholly internal situation, or at least the, the freedom of movement provisions don't apply to a wholly internal situation. In the immigration context, and what the free movement. What do you mean by wholly in, internal to the UK? To a yes, to a member state. So EU law only has purchase on a situation in the free movement context where there's some element of cross-border yes. uh, movement and only where that person is exercising treaty rights. So somebody that's uh, dependent yeah, so on... So in our case, the sponsor is a Dutch national. Exactly. Um, and none of this would be relevant if he were a UK national. No, if he were a UK national, he couldn't obviously acquire an EEA right because he wouldn't, have been ex he wouldn't be exercising his treaty rights in the UK uh, and that would be the end of it for the purposes of the EEA application. But the, the importance here is that there is a distinction between this wholly internal situation, the British national sending money, and an EEA case where you've got an EEA national, and, it's, and the importance is that it is easier, there's less to show by way of dependence for an EEA national than there is for a British national. Um, and so the the important point here is that you cannot simply funnel money through an EEA national in order to concoct effectively a situation where you're saying, I've got an EEA right of residence or right to enter, when in fact what's happening is it's a d effectively disguised internal situation. Well, that's, but that, that's why I, was, I wasn't following you, I'm afraid. Um, the, the, it, it may be harder for... Uh, a British national outside the EEA context to um, create the circumstances in which a dependent relative can come. But that may be because there's a different test of dependence, or it may be because they both have a similar test of dependence, but there are other criteria which make it more onerous. Is it, is it the latter? Uh, I would need to go and the rules, as you know, change with some regularity. I would need to go and double check exactly what the requirements are at this point. Um, there, there have certainly been, so under EU law, dependence as defined in the Court of Justice case law is the central element. Here in, in the immigration rules, you certainly have had, and in Mahad we saw there were requirements as to, uh, no requirements as to public funds, ability to accommodate yourself, things like that. No, but we saw in Mahad that the, the dependence test in rule 317, was essentially expressed in similar language. Well, it was. It, it, I'm going to come to my head because it's not. It's it's wholly or mainly dependent, which is it's not. That's not the same language. The, the rules are expressed. Right, but it's dependent. It's dependent. But the point I'm 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 just struggling with at the moment is, I I could see the force of your submission if uh, the the relevant distinction was in dependence, as it were, um, and and in a, in a relevant aspect of dependence for our, for our case but if you have to show dependence in both circumstances i don't i don't follow what you're seeking to get out of the distinction between so, the internal situation and the eea situation so i, I think the point uh, i'm perhaps being slow i'm not sure that i follow your lordship's <laughs> point now and we're possibly talking about a, a different question because my question is i actually haven't speaking myself, no difficulty with the legal argument you've just presented, but I don't understand its relevance for, for us in this case. Because one can understand the legal proposition that if, if the EEA national is simply a conduit for funds which are coming exclusively from a UK national, then that would not be enough. I have no difficulty with that proposition at all. But that it would require a factual case to be advanced to that effect. And when has it ever been suggested by the Secretary of State in our case that those were the facts here? So the, the, the answer to that question, my Lord, is that it's the appellant's 
burden of proof to show that they meet the requirements of the uh, relevant regulations and it's for the judge to adjudicate upon whether or not they so, met. So is it your submission that the sponsor is always required to prove the negative in the absence of any allegation that, he, that the sponsor is purely a conduit for funds coming exclusively from a British national? They have to prove that that's not the case. Uh, I wouldn't put it quite that high. I, I think in many cases, the tribunal or the Home Office will be able to infer that it's their money because you can see earnings, you can see the outgoings that they spend on rent, on food, etc., and you can see the money that's being sent. And where you've got £25,000 in earnings, this is obviously not figures related to this case, £25,000 in earnings, £5,000 being sent to a relative in Kenya, which is said to meet their basic living needs, you can see that you've got, assuming it's 25 grand net, you've got then 20 grand that that person can live on. And in the absence of any indicator that there is some other thing going on, there's no need to infer, make any other finding other than, well, it's obviously coming from that individual. The difficulty that was had here, uh, and really where the appellant's case falls down in my submission, is that you had evidence that was put forward by the appellant to show that they were able to discharge their burden of proof. And it was obvious when you look at their evidence that there was no money left over. And in, and in those circumstances, at the very least, a question arises as to whether or not uh, that money is being sourced from someone else, or rather, whether they have proved that it's from the sponsor. And in the absence of any explanation, which explanation it's obvious in my submission they would need to give, the tribunal was entitled to, to draw the inference that it did, that, that that money just simply wasn't the money from the sponsor. I'm sorry, I'm still having difficulty with your legal proposition, notwithstanding that nobody understands it. <laughs> the, the, we're talking about bringing relatives of a sponsor to this country. Of an EEA sponsor. No, no, no. A, a, a sponsor. It may be uh, an EEA sponsor in this case, or it may, in the uh, non e you context simply be a UK national. Now, I, I thought your argument was, well, if the uh, sponsor can be entirely funded by a UK national as a conduit, that uh, undermines the position in relation to non-EU cases. But in the one case, the money is coming from a UK national in relation to somebody else's relatives. So it's not comparable. Uh, and that's why I'm having difficulty seeing how it undermines the system. I think I'm making a, a slightly more basic point, um, which is simply that you've got two systems. Yes. And in one, it's the discretion of the Secretary of State to decide what the rules are that apply. And in the other, the Secretary of State has no power, at least pre-Brexit, to depart from EU law as it applies. And so it's it's a sort of constitutional dividing line point that it's important. Uh, what we're dealing with in this case is an application that's been made under the EEA regs, not an application that's been made under the immigration rules. Uh, and so the the point here is that the EU law only has any purchase where there is some cross border element. It's necessary, therefore, to satisfy that there is some that the funds are coming from the individual that. That, that is exercising their treaty rights, uh, and if you don't do that, your EEA application fails. The fact that you might have some other application that you could make, whether that's a dependent relative application or to come here as a student or whatever, it is sort of neither neither here nor there. I, I'm not sure whether I've answered your lordship's question. I'm yeah, not sure whether I, I've. I, I, I'm still having a difficulty. I, we, we, we're coming at this really in order to to, to decide whether we can distinguish Marhad. Uh, because that was that was not a an EEA case. Now leave aside the, the slight difference in the wording you're talking about. Dependency is uh, a, a an element of the of the criteria in both cases. And what I understood you to be directing this argument towards is well, because EEA cases are different from immigration cases, 
it doesn't follow that if it's okay to be a conduit in immigration cases, it's okay to be a conduit in EEA cases. So I think the best way I can answer that question is by reference to the authorities, um, and I haven't yet done that. So um, if, if, if we could just have a look back at GIA, which is tab 20 of the authorities. Certainly. Um, Uh, 35 through to 37, I think it was. Uh, I'm the Advocate General. Oh, sorry, one point I would just make, I don't need the court to turn to it, but there is, the Advocate General in GIA does discuss the distinction between, uh, and the, the court doesn't deal with it, so I don't want to put more weight on it than it bears, but um, the Advocate General does discuss, I think it's a paragraph 30 to 35 of his opinion, uh, the... The, the limited scope of EU law competence in the field of immigration and, and uh, consistently with, I it's not on the point I'm making, but it's, uh, uh, I can say that it's consistent with it. Um, so the, the, in the Grand Chamber judgment in GIA, um, we see that the, the question uh, that was being asked was, was not that that's an issue in this case. I mean, that's obviously the case in many cases that involve EU law. But um, what I would just emphasise is in... Sorry, my PDF reader has just frozen. Um, I can start... I, I may Take go backwards, but if I start with paragraph 43, which is on page 426 of the bundle... The basic question. Yeah, so the, the question that the court is being asked to answer is that in interpreting the relevant uh, provision... Sorry, now it's now jumped up. Um, dependent on them, which is the wording of the directive, and that's re replicated in the, in the citizenship directive that replaced the directive that was in issue in that case, means that members of the family of a community national established in another member state need the material support of that community national. And as my learned friend correctly uh, accepts, the or his or her spouse isn't, isn't applicable. And we see, uh, sorry, if we go back to, now that I've managed to get to it, paragraph 35, we see, uh, in fact, my learned friend took, took the court to this, the status of dependent is, according to the case law of the Court of Justice, the result of a factual situation characterised by the fact that material support for that family member is provided by the community national who has exercised his free movement rights. And then in 37, uh, 36 deals with whether you need a right to, a legal right that's enforceable against them, and you don't. 37, uh, in order to determine whether the relatives of the spouse, sorry, it doesn't matter about there, but are depend whether the relatives are dependent on the latter, that's again, the community national. So we see in the Grand Chamber's decision, references are, are re the, when it's being discussed, the, the, the language used by the court are replete with references to dependence on the community national. Now, they don't go so far as to explain why that is, and partly that's because it's obvious from the language of the directive that it has to be on that community national. But the reason is this distinction between uh, the wholly internal situation and the cross-border situation. Um, in relation to Mahad, it may be helpful just to look at some of the other passages on, in Lord Brown's speech, um, where he... How do we get out that they're drawing a distinction between the community situation? The internal situation. They're only dealing with the community situation, so naturally they're talking about a community national. Of course. They're not concerned to draw any distinction in this passage. No. Uh, and, I mean, there are... No, they're not. Um, but my... Um, I, I don't want the court to, uh, to misunderstand my submission. I'm, I'm not saying that there's some comparison that needs to be done with, between community nationals exercising treaty rights and British nationals, all I'm saying is that this is an EEA application. EEA applications only apply where there is an EEA national exercising treaty rights. That's as far as I need to go, and that's as far as I go. But then, so what is my question? I don't understand yeah. where, uh, where this is taking me. Well, uh, we know uh, he's uh, Dutch, we know he's living here, has been exercising his rights. Uh, uh, and then we go to GIA, and it, my submission is that the Grand Chamber has made clear that the dependence has to be on that mm -hmm. national, and implicitly not on somebody else. I was then asked, well, what's the difference with Mahad? Uh, and there are, I think, two answers to that. The first is, well, that had nothing to do with the EEA rights. Uh, it's all about the immigration rules. So what? 
well, and, and therefore it can't be used as an interpretation to an EU law right that has to be interpreted consistently across the member states uh, and is totally else other than, than a domestic situation. Um, so the, fir the first point is it's not, a, it's not a guide to the interpretation of some other legal regime, but also when one looks at Lord Brown's reasoning, he isn't just looking at the meaning of dependence, he is looking at it in the, the meaning of dependence in the context of the other requirements that are there set, that were then uh, part of the immigration rules. So um, if we just start again at, page, at paragraph three on page 51, Of course, sorry, it's, it's the bottom of paragraph three immediately, the extract from the rules immediately above paragraph four. Yes, thank you. Um, and so we see there that the relevant rule is, firstly, is financially wholly or, wholly or mainly dependent, and of course that's the point I make, that it's in, in this context, in the rules context, it's you don't have to be dependent, you have to be wholly or mainly dependent, which is a different threshold, uh, on the relative present and settled in the UK. So that's either a British national or somebody with indefinite leave to remain. And can and will be accommodated adequately together with any dependents without recourse to funds, to public funds in accommodation with which the sponsor owns exclusively and can or will be maintained together with any dependents without recourse to public funds. Now, just to signpost where I'm going, the point that Lord Brown, the, the, the way in which Lord Brown gets to his interpretation of dependence in this context is by reference to the importance that the Secretary of State has placed on not being on the, the relatives coming to the UK, not being dependent on the state. And that's not, that doesn't feature anywhere in the EEA cases. And we see that um, at, I think it's paragraph 12, the critical paragraphs, the rules for the court's interpretation here are those dealing with maintenance, not accommodation. But an, part of the, an important part of the context for their interpretation is, sorry, this is on page, bottom of page 54 and um, paragraph 12. An important part of the context of their interpretation is the way in which parallel accommodation requirements have been construed. As to this, the position is well established. They will allow the parties to live together in accommodation owned and provided, quite possibly free, by a third party. Um, so we see, again, provided that accommodation is provided not by the state but by somebody else, it, the rules themselves allow that to happen. And that's just not part of anything to do with the EEA regulations. It's not part of it, but it's equally true of the EEA regulations. You say not. Well, uh, you, you say if um, someone is able to give their earnings to a, a family member out of this country, um, if uh, uh, they can only do that by living effectively grace and favour with family members, that's not good enough. That's good enough. That's your case, according to your paragraph 39 of your Skelton argument. I, I think that must be... Uh, let me just think that through <laughs> before I concede, the, concede it. The, I think that must be right. I think that must be that must be my case. Yeah. What said against that, as I understood the reliance on Mahout was acknowledging, of course, one's immigration and one's European, but the proper approach to dependency should be consistent across the piece. Um, well, uh, uh, and that if this, this shows that actually providing it can show that the recipient is dependent on the sponsor. It, it, it may well be that the court thinks that there is a good policy reason why dependence on EU nationals and why dependence on British or third country nationals would sensibly be the same. My position is that, that that's not the proper legal analysis because in one context it's for the Secretary of State to decide what is required and in the other it's for the EU institutions to decide what's required and I think it's in my submission it's dangerous to try to read across from one context to another where the two systems of law have developed entirely separately um, there's no I mean there's no reference in Mahad 
any of the Court of Justice cases on dependence. There's no, if in Mahad they said, well, in EU law, it's dependence means X, and we think, well, the Secretary of State must, when she was making the immigration rules, have intended to mean the same thing, then I can see that, that might be a there, there might be a logical connection. But these are the fact that the same word is used by two legal systems in different, con two separate legal systems in separate contexts, um, means that, in my, in my submission, we simply cannot read across from one to the other. I'm sorry, I'm still not understanding this. Suppose you had a case, uh, an EEA case, in which uh, the sponsor is using all his own money and uh, it, 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 if that is the case, then the requirements, the relevant requirement that we're talking about would be fulfilled, uh, whether or not once the dependents got here, you, uh, they would, in a domestic concept, be able to fulfil 4 and 4A. Correct. So those, those form no part of the EA regime, from which one infers, doesn't it, that they are, as it were, deemed to be complied with, in the sense of they're not, they're not being requirements. What, I, what I'm... I'm not putting this very well, but I'm, I'm, I'm still failing to understand how this is a distinction that makes a difference. It, it, it makes a difference because we're only concerned here with the EU provisions. Yes, but the EU provisions are, uh, in this respect, less onerous. Yes. And uh, the more onerous conditions in Marhad were nevertheless found to be complied with even if the sponsor was being used as a conduit. So I suppose my point is, is simply that they're different and it, it doesn't actually matter whether one is more or less onerous than the other. The, the, the point in terms of the interpretation of EU law is that I make is simply that one doesn't look to the domestic system. One looks to the wording insofar as it helps of, of the Grand Chamber and GIA. So it, it, was it unfair to characterise your submission as that the difference is material not because of any expressed terms of the rules but simply because they're different regimes. They're different regimes and they arrive and, and in, inevitably with any interpretive exercise one is inevitably looking at them in their respective contexts of which that regime is uh, a very significant part but as one saw from the, the reasoning in Mahad the, the interpretation of dependence in that context also was informed by requirements that simply don't exist in, in the other context, and so one can't read those across in the way that was done in, in, in Mahad. But or, what, how rather? are we in any position to get into this interesting legal debate? So, I, I, because, I don't... Because, because you know, I, I see the force of your submissions as a matter of law, but I don't understand their relevance because the, the, the legal analysis... Uh, only kicks in once you've got some facts that have been found on a sustainable basis. So uh, I actually, my, my submission is that the court doesn't have to resolve this issue um, in, in any event, this is, this point of EU law. The I, I agree with um, my Lord Lord Justice Arnold that, that really it's, the question is, well, what, the, the question from a fairness point of view, which is obviously the, the, the central ground, is should the appellant and or the sponsor have expected the tribunal to be considering the issue of whether or not he was the source of the funds. In circumstances where the contrary was never suggested. Well, that, that comes back to my, I, 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 I do need to go to some, I do, I'm afraid, need to go to some cases on fairness and, and proper procedure in, in the tribunal, but the, 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 the submission is um, that where the appellant bears the burden of proof of showing that he meets the requirements of the regulations, which includes the requirement that the appellants are dependent now, on can him. Let me be clear. Is it your submission that the burden is always on the appellant to reduce positive evidence to prove the negative that they are that they are not a conduit for funds coming from someone else, even in the absence of any allegation 
to that effect. Is that is that your submission? No, um, I, 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 my submission is the burden is on the appellant to show that they are the source of the funds, or rather that the dependence is on them, and that one can do that by inviting the tribunal in a relevant case to draw an inference from, it goes back to my example of if you've got a £25,000 salary and £5,000 worth of uh, remittances, then plainly they, that the obvious inference in the absence of anything else is that that's their money that's being sent. Uh, and what you have in this case is an obvious issue on the evidence that, in my submission, an obvious issue, on the evidence that the appellant and the sponsor have chosen to put forward which shows that he simply doesn't have any money once these remittances are uh, are are sent, a and it, it follows that there's then a question that it's o open to the tribunal to ask uh, when writing a decision. Well, wh what's or, sorry? It follows that they need to explain if if. Sorry, I'm not. I'm not I can see from can, my lady's facial expression that I, I'm not yes. being clear. No, I, I do know, but look, what I'm puzzled about is, as I understand it, we have that we have the position of the refusal letters, where credibility or an issue about um, source of money was was not an issue. They were saying is you, you didn't provide enough. Um, the sporadic evidence was sporadic. Was, the, sporadic was, yeah. the, was grouping for the word, but but it wasn't saying you know we're not satisfied that this comes from you. So the, it goes to the FTT um, on the basis of knowing what the reasons had been given in the refusal letter. So a lot more um, receipts are produced and the, the printouts show the name of the sponsor as showing the money coming from the sponsor and going to the relevant yeah. family members, right? Yeah. So that that is, so the credibility or the source of the money hadn't been a feature for the uh, assessor, and they produced they produced f a physical paper evidence that they were the that it was coming from them. Now, what, what what I need your help with is why it was then obvious um, that that was not going to be enough when it had never been raised, and that they then should have either um, produced different evidence to show. That the accommodation wasn't rent free meant uh, um, all found to use that old fashioned expression, <laughs> or alternatively, I'm not sure you, I've been taken yet to any uh, EU law uh, that says for the purposes of these regulations, um, the fact that it meant that the sponsor is themselves dependent means that is not good enough and, and undermines um, the, the establishment of a dependency on a community national. So I'm not sure, for me, I'm not sure why that's think, obvious. There are, well, I think, so there are, I think two points that are separate there, if I may. The first is what's the obvious, what's, why is it obvious that, that the source of the funds, that it, that it needs to be proved that the source of the funds is the sponsor and not someone else. Well, well, they would say they did give you that evidence well, because they produced the printout. Yes, but uh, I just want to, if I may, just if I make sure I've understood your ladyship's questions. The first question is what makes it obvious? And the, the second is is the sort of EU law point. And it seems to me that they're separate points. But the, the, the reason it's, so the first is that it's not, the fact that a matter is not raised in a decision letter is not tantamount to a concession as to that issue. And so the fact that the decision letter does not say, and we're not satisfied that in fact the source of the funds is you, doesn't mean that that was not an issue before the first tier tribunal. The, and I, I may just make that good if I may, just whilst I'm here. It's um, the case in which it's dealt with is um, it's. It's an old case, and it's always been followed since, but it, it wasn't ever reported. So with the bits that we get from it is, is, is in a separate reported case. That case is called Ganidagli, and it's at tab 19 of the authority contract. 
always the way it works perfectly in the quiet of your own home. Well, well, uh, yes. Apologies, I should have put a, a hard copy authorities bundle in addition, but... Um... Don't worry, take your time. Well, the bit that's sidelined in, in our copy is, is paragraph 20. In which case, that is the paragraph that I wish to, to take you. the court to. Uh, and the point that's made there is that there's a world of difference, this is referring to first-tier tribunal proceedings, between a concession that's positively made and simply a point that's not challenged. Um, if I remember rightly, that's in the asylum context, but it, 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 in the immigration context, there's no diff I, I don't see that there's any difference. And, and so it remain the burden remained on the appellant to prove that they met all of the requirements of the regulations. There was no concession that it wasn't an issue, that, that, that he had to show that the dependence was on him. Mm -hmm. it, it, that will be done in different cases by, by in different ways. And, and this, I think, may be the answer um, to my Lord's question earlier, that, that it isn't the case that in every case you're going to need to put forward positive evidence, because in some cases it could be obvious from the extent of the remittances. But in my submission, in a case such as this, where the distinction between, or the difference between the remittances and uh, the uh, profits figures are, are so small, that cries out for, in my submission, an explanation. And in the absence of that explanation, um, it, it, it cried out for cross-examination is what it cried out for, particularly as, you, as there would appear from your, my better understanding now you've explained it, um, because there's two different possibilities, aren't there? Possibility one, which is the one that the um, judge came to at first instance, uh, that he wasn't providing the money at all, it must have come from a third party, and possibility number two would be that he's only able to do it because he's maintained by his family, no, which you're now telling us from a legal point of view, because we can't cross-reference over to the immigration rules, is not good enough. So and, I, I think I can answer that by reference to the, to the authorities, um, but the, The point, the point that I, the basic point is that it's it's the appellant's burden, and if he's not adduced evidence which answers the doubt that's caused by the very close uh, figures between the remittances and the income, then he doesn't discharge the burden of proof. Uh, I mean that's that's based that, yes, that's the point, and it's point. his burden. Yes. And the Home Office could had the Home Office been there, the Home Office could have sat back, not cross-examined, and made submissions on whether the evidence was itself sufficient to to, to discharge the burden. Well, suppose the explanation were hypothetically these are these are draft tax returns, but he's a he's a taxi driver, and tax um, returns for self-employed taxi drivers will involve. Uh, very substantial allowances being made, not always on a mathematical basis, estimates of business use of the phone, and one of those will be capital allowances. Now, suppose in a hypothetical case that uh, actually the £127 was a, a completely false point because he bought a car the previous year and he was allowed to expense it at 100%. Um, and so uh, that had come out of his previous year's earnings, and if you look at the, this this year, um, although it was expensing then, leaving him the with only... The figure wasn't reflective of his cash flow position, is it? Exactly so. Exactly. Yeah. Now... And which it, ties... It, sorry, but that which potentially ties into what we see in the transcript about what he said his monthly take was. So... so, so 6,000. So the question is, does, does, does someone have to come along and give that explanation just in case somebody thinks, oh, well, hold on, it doesn't, or, or is he allowed to, to to go along and say, well, if nobody asked me about that, so it's it, not it, something it, I've got to I've got to explain. So in my submission, it, it depend it will depend on the case, but it it depends on whether or not there is some reason to doubt that he is the the source of the funds, effectively, and and the discrepant or the the uh, lack of difference between the profit figures which he is putting forward as indicative uh, as indicative of his income. But why, but, but, why does that give rise to a doubt? If if a, an explanation might feasibly be that he's expensing a, a car that he's bought earlier. Why? Why is that? Why is there any inference to be drawn from the from the figures? Well, I, 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 
it, it's not suggested that the inference which the judge drew was one that what that he wasn't entitled to draw. Um, well, yes, it is because because it, it's procedurally unfair to draw it. Is the case? Well, sorry, it, it's not suggested that and, and it's because <clears throat> because the point had never been suggested. So I mean, it would be completely different if one was dealing with a sponsor who had no employment. Then you would obviously have an issue if he's spending money to people abroad. Where is the money coming from? But here, there was no challenge to the fact that he was self-employed, no challenge to the fact that he was earning money, no challenge to the fact that the money was being sent. So it all comes down to a question of accountancy in circumstances where the sponsor has no idea that this is even an issue. Can I just, um, I just want to make a point on the no challenge point, because that really does go to my a concession is not the, the same as no, it, 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 I mean, I've made the point, but it's it isn't uh, it isn't the case that that the Home Office was required to put forward a positive case as to any of this. It was for the appellant to prove his case. Well, Mr. Skinner, you've you've been um, very courageous in responding to 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 all of this. Um, I, I, for my part, have got your point completely, and I'm very, uh, namely, that the burden was on the appellant. Uh, the there was a very obvious um, lacuna in the evidence because of the disparity between the £127 and the money that was um, sent abroad um, and and that should have been addressed. It was for them to, to address that in order to discharge the burden. I think, does that summarise your...? It, it, it does. Can I just make it good by reference to two authorities? Please do. What my, The purpose of my intervention now to is to try on. and give you some... No, oh. not to move on particularly, although I'm conscious you've got, you haven't got you have had a chance properly to go through your five, but actually to give you some breathing space and to say we are listening and no, we have grateful. taken on board your point. So mm. please, let's, let's let you just get on for a minute. Thank you. Um, the first to your authority, if I can uh, take the court to, is WN... Surrender and Credibility, New Evidence. It's tab 14 of the Authorities Bundle. Yes, thank you. Uh, and it's paragraph 25. This is a decision um, of some uh, age now, but I think there's no suggestion that it's no longer good law, and I think it was, in fact, put in by my learned friend into the bundle. Sorry, uh, remind me the paragraph number. Uh, paragraph 25 thank is you. the first. There, there are two, two aspects of this case that are relevant, so I'm going to deal with them both together. Um, the, the first is at paragraph 25, we see how allegations as to what happened before an adjudicator should be dealt with. Um, and we uh, about a fifth of the way, I think six lines down, we see first on the left-hand side, and we see this is the way the upper tribunal dealt with it. No evidence uh, as to what happened. Uh, but, but as you yourself informed us earlier, this was at a time when there was no recording no, at, of but the, the hearings. So how is this relevant in circumstances where you have a recording which establishes unambiguously what was said and what was not said? Because I, I'm not relying on this passage for the type of evidence that needs yeah. to be adduced. I'm relying on it to show that what, need, what needs to be done is that an appellant who wants to allege that something happened before the first tier tribunal has to adduce some evidence. In this case, it's what didn't happen. Uh, well, yes. And, and that... Can, ha can be, I accept, that can be evidenced now most sensibly by the transcript of, of the, the hearing before the first-tier tribunal. It could, as we've seen, also be done by a witness statement and, and whatever. And there are cases where a witness statement has been adduced and the tribunal, the upper tribunal, has then looked with some care at whether that's sufficient to discharge the burden where that indicates that something different happened to, to what the judge said happened in, in, I can't remember if it's his or her judgment in the first-tier tribunal. The point I draw from this is simply that there has to be some evidence to, uh, to make good the submission that what did or didn't happen did or didn't happen. Um, and one sees, if, if I could ask the court just to read from first, which is six lines down, to it's about ten lines down to the word adjudicator capitalised on the left-hand side. And I would just emphasise, just to answer my little point, uh, at the end of that passage, if it's to be said that an adjudicator has been unfair in the questions which he has asked or has not asked, I think that is a typo, um, or some event occurred before the adjudicator which warrants an appeal on the ground of error of law, I think or is then also a typo in that passage, it is necessary that there be evidence of what happened before the adjudicator. 
uh, and that's what I rely on that for. And I would just point to the, the concluding sentence of that paragraph, that allegations about what happened in front of the adjudicator are made far too often with no supporting evidence. Credence should not be given to allegations not supported by evidence. That is the approach that the upper tribunal has uh, mandated uh, that the tribunal take, and, and, and that's the that appellants take, and that is uh, what didn't happen in my submission in, in this case. Um, the, the other point that arises from WN is as to whether it is fair or not not to put a point, um, and I, I don't want to, the court to have to read it now, but this starts at paragraph 26, and we see two authorities referred to. There's the Cocker case, which is a decision of the outer house of the Court of Session, and there's Maheshwaran. Cocker is not in the bundle, but is cited at length, I think, it, it here. Um, Maheshwaran is in the bundle at uh, tab five, uh, sorry, tab eight. Um, there's a great deal of subsequent case law on this. I mean, is there's the 19th century authority, which is quite obscure, called Brown and Dunn. There's the more recent decision of the of the Court of Appeals in a case called Markham and Zifra, and then there's still more recently there's a Supreme Court decision um, about five years ago, in the name of which escapes me, which goes into all of this in quite a lot of detail. There, there is a lot of authority on the maybe it's the Privy Council. I maybe there, there is a Privy Council case. I, I, if I remember rightly, though, all of the recent authorities on this are not in the immigration context. Uh, at, they are in uh, mostly in a commercial context. That obviously fairness as a bright line principle applies equally, but, but the context is relevant. And, and one, once I've just taken you through this, the other authority is HA, which is the decision of, among others, Lord Reed, uh, when he was an in-house judge, uh, where he emphasizes the particular context of the immigration tribunal and the way it works. Uh, and so I just want to, th these are the two authorities I need well, to take. Take, to. take us through those then, that's very helpful. So. Can I just ask you, just so I'm, I've, I've sort of ticked it off my, in, in my mind, does it make any difference uh, to your submissions of, uh, going to this uh, that permission to appeal was granted by the first tier tribunal itself? It, it, it doesn't. I, I, there is um, there is more recent authority that says that permission shouldn't be granted without at least requiring the some evidence to be provided between the uh, grant. I mean, the proper position really is that the the application for permission should be adjourned, the appellant directed to produce the evidence of what happened before the first tier, so that the judge can, who's deciding permission can make a properly informed assessment of whether, whether there's an arguable case. Where that hasn't happened and, and the transcript or any other evidence hasn't been adduced, what one does sometimes see, no doubt for pragmatic reasons, when upper tribunal judges have long permission lists, uh, is that it's granted and directions are then given now, that didn't happen here, and I, I suspect it happened because permission was granted by a first-tier judge who, again, had a long list and just didn't turn their mind to it. Um, but it, it, it makes no difference to the principles which are well established uh, in, in the immigration sphere, well known to immigration practitioners, um, and set out what an appellant has to do. Now, I, I accept that, that in a commercial context where you've got a pleaded particulars, pleaded defence, you can see much more precisely what's an issue, then, then these points about, well, that what point wasn't taken, and therefore, in effect, it's taken as admitted, you know, if you don't put in a positive defence, or you don't say that I'm not admitting something that's taken to be admitted, that's different to this context. No, it's not a question of what's admitted. It's, it's fairness to witnesses. It's not fair to disbelieve them when the point hasn't been put to them in cross-examination. So uh, I, I'm going to come to that because Lord Reed deals with that in HA. Well, let, let's give you Pete's to go through these and we'll Sorry, see. Sorry, just, just as a matter of practice, um, uh, which I'm not familiar with, get, getting a transcript, do you do you have to apply for one or and do you have to justify it uh, and is it a public expense or is it there for the asking? I, I'm afraid I've never done it. Um, I, I suspect those who sit on the other side of the court will... It, it's a, it, it's a post-pandemic because everything went online and it became much easier to get transcripts from online platforms, uh, which I think this was, that yeah. then, I think the first year tribunal then realised, well, there's no real problem if we, if we, uh, and I think it's been rolled out in the tribunal and other tribunals as well, the first instance where recognising this as a, as a potential problem where, you know, if you don't have a transcript, what in, happened below this? I mean, in many other areas, um, you have to make a specific application for a transcript, you have to justify it, uh, and you often have to pay for it yourself. So I, um, I, I, I don't know about cost. I don't. I think you have, I think if you write to the tribunal and ask for it, you will get it. I don't think you have to justify it in any way. Uh -huh. um, 
Mister is shaking her head. Can you can you help us with this? Sorry. Sorry. Well, I'll tell you what. Let, let's let's not waste time on it. Now. Yes. Come 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 back to it. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a practice direction at page forty four in the bundle of authorities and paragraph twelve. Um, deals with the subject. Number 12, beginning at page 44. Thank you. All right. So you can make an application and the president can issue a practice statement about fees. But that doesn't really give you the answer. Can I just make one, one observation about this practice uh, direction? Is that this is referring to the record of proceedings, which until recently was always the judge's note of what happened at the proceedings. This isn't actually referring to recordings. I don't know what the, the fee position is and whether or not, in every case, the recording is deemed to be the record of proceedings. But um, I, I, I would suggest, respectfully, that this possibly uh, doesn't take us very far. Um, but well, we can come back up to that if we need it. So, no, we've, been, we've read the part of paragraph 20. Five of the WM that you asked us. Is and there then, anything else you want us to look at in that case? So I, I, I'd like the tribunal, uh, the court, excuse me, to look at uh, twenty six onwards, but I don't want to trouble the court to do it now. If, if I'd like just, to just read it later, if you wouldn't, if, if that's um, uh, twenty six uh, through to where? Uh, through to, uh, in fact, through to thirty four. Um, and can I just highlight a couple of points from that? Yes. Um, Para 28 on page 192, the top of the page, tribunal held, even where the Secretary of State is not represented, the appellant cannot assume that points which are not put by the adjudicator to him for his comments are points which are to be regarded as accepted, even if they are obvious points of contradiction or employability, which he has failed to grapple with. It's not necessary for fair hearing that every point of concern which an adjudicator has be put expressly to a party where credibility is an issue. And then just on the surrendering guidelines, the, the surrendering guidelines are guidelines that were promulgated by the upper tribunal to deal with a situation that arose when the volume of cases in what was then the AIT far surpassed the resources of the Home Office to attend every hearing. And so this problem about what do you do as a first year tribunal, what's now a first year tribunal judge, when there's nobody from the Home Office there, um, because there were points about there were complaints about judges complaining to uh, asking too many questions and there were complaints about judges not asking enough questions mm -hmm. and the surrendering guidelines were then guidelines to the judges uh, as to how to go about that and I think it said uh, that those weren't followed in this case but one of the points that's made is that that's not of itself an error of law they're just meant to be guidelines they're not a straitjacket um, and um, in fact that's at paragraph 29 and the test is whether or not it was fair or unfair. Do you accept that they weren't followed in this case? Uh, we've got the, we, uh, page one eight one behind tab thirteen. We've got the guide, the surrendering guidelines, and next to the the decision in MNM. I, I'm afraid I haven't turned my mind to whether or not they were specifically followed. And can I, I, can I just, quite can detailed, I just put, but put, put, well, can I put paragraph five to you, of course. Uh, which is at page one eighty one of our bundles. Where, where so, no matters of credibility are raised in the letter of refusal. Can I, can I just um, take one back a step? Um, uh, if one starts at um, paragraph two, we have the function of the adjudicators to review the reasons given by the Home Office. But this is an asylum context for, for refusing asylum within the context of the evidence put before him and the submissions made on behalf of the appellant, and then to come to his or presumably her own conclusions as to whether or not the appeal should be allowed or dismissed. In doing so, he must, of, of, of course, observe the correct burden and standard of proof. Then paragraph three deals with the situation where the first year tribunal has noticed that the, the uh, Home Office isn't going to be represented. That, as far as I'm aware, is a relatively rare occurrence, especially nowadays. I, I think Home Office represent, tend to be unrepresented in cases where someone's ill or there just isn't the capacity to cover it. It's usually something that arises at the last minute. Yeah. Um, four, then, is where matters of credibility are raised in the letter of refusal, the special adjudicator should request the representative to address these matters. 
And whether, but whether or not these matters are addressed by the representative and whether or not the special adjudicator has himself expressed any particular concern, he is entitled to form his own view as to credibility on the basis of the material before him. And you then get to the paragraph that your Lordship directed me to, where no matters of credibility are raised in the letter of refusal, but from a reading of the papers, the special adjudicator himself considers that there are matters of credibility arising therefrom. He should similarly point these matters out to the representative and ask that they be dealt with either in examination of the appellant or in submissions. Uh, so I would accept that that wasn't done. And in fact, I think the judge in this case said that wasn't that wasn't followed. The, the upper tribunal judge said that that didn't happen. Um, uh, but the, we are we are in paragraph five territory because well, we we are. But in uh, relevant uh, respects, no matters of credibility were raised in the refusal. So that, that's right. Um, I would just go back to the point I made before, which is that following the gra following these guidance is not uh, is not an error. Not following the guidance is not, not an error. It's well. not necessarily. No. Um, I, I understand. That. And so, sorry. Let me just go back, if I may, just so that I get through WN um, without missing anything that I wanted to draw to your Lordship's attention. Your Lordship's attention. Um, I I indeed, sorry. At paragraph thirty, we get this point. The real test to be applied is whether it was fair or unfair. Um, in each case where there's non-compliance with the guidance, it remains for the person asserting the unfairness or apparent unfairness to show that the actual or apparent unfairness was present. Um, it's not sufficient merely to assert that the guidelines were not complied with. It's not by itself an error of law not to comply with the guidelines. The point is that compliance with the guidelines will make it very difficult, if not impossible. Compliance with the guidelines will make it very difficult, if not impossible, for an appellant to assert that it was unfair. But it's not conclusive to it. And then... Um, it, para 31 is then important because it says those guidelines need to be read in light of the two subsequent decisions uh, in Cocker and Maheshwaran, where, as here, credibility generally at issue. Obligation is on an appellant to deal with obvious points which relate to his credibility without necessarily being asked to comment on them by the adjudicator. Appellant cannot expect to be able to make a tactical, de tactical decisions as to whether he should deal with an issue or ignore it, later to complain successfully in, if an adjudicator has not raised it with him. Appellant cannot simply say that the question was not put and therefore it's unfair for an inference to be drawn adversely to him on that point where his credibility has been put in issue and the issue dealt with by the adjudication and determination goes to credibility. Whether it is unfair depends on the, the circumstances. Um, and then just para 34 deals with guideline 5, which uh, your Lordship draw, drew my attention to. It needs to cover the position where there's no uh, issue of credibility referred to in the refusal letter, and yet it may be obvious that further material provided to the adjudicator raises issues of credibility. Uh, and so this is really the, the crux of, of, of the point Was here. it obvious? Yeah. Um, issues will arise from the new material, should, should be raised or put to the adjudicator to the appellant so he may answer, answer it, but it does not mean that the hearing has been unfair where that has, is not done. That depends on the degree, to, the degree to which the issue of credibility was one which an advocate might properly to have realised needed to be dealt with or on the material which he was presenting to the adjudicator. Uh, and then there are obvious points that are uh, raised, one of, and this is again in the asylum context, but one of which is how obvious implausibilities and improbabilities in it are likely to be answered. And I would say, that, I mean, it, obviously this case, the facts of this case were not in the mind of the tribunal there, but that's the sort of territory that we're in. That, I think, deals with um, WN. Um, I prefer to Maheshwaran in my skeleton, and I've set out the relevant paragraphs there. I don't propose to take take the court to it now. Um, HA, I do yes. uh, need to take the court to, because it post-dates this decision. Um, and again, I'm afraid there's a relatively long passage that I would like the tribunal it's to fine. read. We're happy but to I, do. I think, as with all the questions of fairness, because, because it is so fact-specific, one can give guidelines that one consider why at one case went one way and one case went another. Um, and you'll have seen sidebar this from two... Uh, so where, what tab is it, Jane? Oh, excuse me. It's tab seven. Um, it begins on page 97, and then paragraph two is at page 99. Uh, and paragraph two deals with the specifics of the tribunal procedure rules. I will say that those those procedure rules have been now been superseded, but I don't think in any material way to the point that is then made in paragraph three that they're designed to secure procedural fairness but do not replicate ordinary judicial procedures. This reflects certain practical difficulties commonly experienced in asylum and immigration appeals, um, etc., etc. Uh, and really, the key point. So we then see, sorry, the 
inner house then cites para 3 of Maheshwar and <coughs> para 5. Um, we then see in paragraph 6, it's been emphasised, it's a specialist tribunal, that's obviously well established, um, has implication for the procedure. Uh, although it's adversarial, the tribunal is not confined to consideration of the evidence and submissions presented to it by the parties. We then go on. I don't think there's anything in uh, seven that I need this court to look at, but so eight, we then get. Um, well, seven may be quite important. The tribunal may identify an issue which hasn't been raised. It would be unfair ordinarily, at least, to base its decision upon its view of that issue without giving the parties an opportunity to address it upon them. The, so, my submission on that is that the issue is not a new issue where it is always one that the appellant would have to approve, namely that the appellants were dependent on the sponsor. Um, so it, that, in, in that case, if I remember, that's referred to in HA, if I remember rightly there, um, there was an issue about pregnancy and nobody had ever raised uh, the issue of what protective measures to avoid pregnancy had been used. And the judge based their decision on the fact that there was just no evidence about what protective measures had been used and that was just a completely well, new that was a factual, factual issue. But the, the legal issue um, was whether the claim for asylum was made out on the basis of the affair with the or the relationship with the general's daughter. So it's a it's a it's a factual issue, as it were. It's not the legal issue. That, that's uh, well. I, that's right, insofar as it goes, but the factual and the legal issue in this case are the same. In, in the, the question of whether or not uh, he's the source of the funds is the legal issue and it is a factual issue. So I, I, I'm not sure that that distinction necessarily takes us, with respect, uh, any further. Um, if I could just draw specific attention uh, to, at the bottom of page 102, we see um, Lord Reed saying, Referring to uh, the case of Kreber that he's discussing in paragraph 8, the applicant could reasonably proceed on the basis that there was no need for him to produce evidence on this vital point besides a letter. And it's important to know that this is a letter, uh, if I remember the case correctly, from Amnesty International. And that had been accepted as a letter to which that could be reliance could be placed on in another case. Uh, and obviously it came from a reputable source. That, that obviously doesn't apply where somebody... Uh, as in every case, has to show that they can be believed as a witness, uh, and it's only their own evidence that's being put forward. Um, I, I appreciate I'm cherry picking, but I, no, I, I no, do. No, no, no. This is most yeah. helpful because then we, you're highlighting the parts you want us to uh, concentrate on when we uh, read through it again. When um, one gets down to, oh, I'm grateful for that. Um, when one gets down to paragraph eleven. Uh, we see a consideration of the ex parte Williams case. Uh, in that case, the judicator had made adverse findings on credibility on the basis of discrepancies between the account of material events which the applicant had given in evidence and that which was given in the asylum application and his asylum interview. And in that case, it, the judge didn't put any of these discrepancies to, to, to the witness, and that wasn't unfair. The adjudicator was not bound, the final sentence of uh, Para 11, to, as a matter of natural justice, to point out the inconsistencies. Para 12 is important. There is no general unfair, in general, no unfairness in proceeding in that way, since to, since to uh, an applicant can generally be expected to be aware that the tribunal will have to assess his credibility. Uh, and... This, this is where there were inconsistent statements. Are you suggesting that there are inconsistent statements in the present case? No, I'm not. But the, the point, is, point is a more general one, which is, which is simply that credibility is always an issue in the employment tribunal, in the uh, immigration tribunal, excuse me. Uh, and it, it, it's, always, it's always going to be for a judge to assess whether or not Cred somebody is telling you. Credibility is always an issue. Uh, yes, I mean, that's... Right, that's, so... so do I understand your proposition to be this, that in the immigration context, unlike in any other context known to me, a credi the credibility of a witness is always open, whether it's been impugned or not? So I, I think that 
I think that's right, yes. Um, the, the, there is, certainly in the context of documents, there's a significant difference, but I appreciate that's not the point that your Lordship's asking me about, but um, in the context of documentary evidence, uh, which I, the court may well know the case of Tanvir Ahmed, which is referred to in many cases, it's always for an appellant in an asylum or human rights claim or in any immigration claim to show that the, a document that's put forward can be relied upon. Uh, now, that may differ from the position in civil litigation where you might start from the position that a document's contents are reliable uh, in the absence of any indicator to the contrary. Um, and so in that sense, credibility is generally the credibility of the document, whether any weight can be put on it, is, is in that, and that's obviously different to whether it's a genuine document, but the, the weight that can be put on the document is always an issue in a way that it isn't in, in civil proceedings. So, so if in this case, again, I'm talking hypothetically, the first-tier tribunal judge, without raising to the hearing, had said, well, I've looked at the copy of the passport in the bundle, and I'm not sure that the photo looks exactly like the sponsor. And on that basis, I'm not satisfied that the uh, nationality requirement is fulfilled. That's bad luck. So that they should have been ready to deal with that point at the hearing. It, 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 it comes down to the, the, the question of how obvious it is that, that, that it's going, that it may be an issue. It, it, well, that's why I was just questioning, you said credibility is always an issue. <laughs> credibility in what in what in in what respect? If you have something which is accepted in a, uh, a refusal letter and appears to be supported by the documents, uh, I myself have some difficulty with the idea that those who are conducting the hearing should treat the credibility of that document for that issue as 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 being an issue in the proceedings. I mean, one's got to be practical about these things. Uh, this is meant to be a procedure which is uh, as speedy and as cheap as it can sensibly be. It, it, it certainly is the case that, that the, the reliability of any document... I, 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 I'm slightly nervous about using credibility in perhaps different, different meanings in different contexts, but certainly the reliability of any document that's put forward as evidence in an asylum or human rights appeal is, uh, is an issue for the, tri for the tribunal judge to of determine. Course, I mean, without that, it, That's a question of weight, essentially. Um, and, and what you can get out of it. I mean, of course, any evidence has to be analysed. So I have no difficulty with what you're saying about documents at all. But we're not talking about documents here. We're talking about witnesses who are giving evidence. And as I understand it, what you're telling us, and maybe you're right, I'm, I'm, I'm finding it a little surprising, is that it is open to an immigration tribunal to disbelieve any witness whether or not that witness's credibility has ever been put in issue. I, I, I'm not putting it quite that high. Um, your Lordship's putting it to me at a very high level of generality, uh, and I come back to the point that I've already made, that it really does depend on the facts and how central and how how ob whether it's obvious or not obvious. Now, there may be shades of obviousness. I accept that, and that obviously is a question of, as with any question of procedural fairness, for the court to assess, but the, 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 if, if somebody puts forward evidence, it is for the tribunal to assess their cred the credibility of that evidence. There may be, and, and HA says this, there may be circumstances where not putting a, a key point which goes to their credibility leads to unfairness. I, I don't dispute that, so I'm not, I, I don't, I don't, so I'm not putting the submission as high as, as your lordship put it to me, which is that it's always open to a first-tier tribunal judge to go away and sort of delve into the details and not put something that might be absolutely essential to, to the making of a claim to an appellant. I don't, I don't put it that high. There may be circumstances in, in which it's, it's obvious, as a matter of fairness, that, that, that it has to be put. My submission is that the, the HA makes clear that... Um, That the, the tribunal's not under any general, this is uh, paragraph uh, 13, the tribunal's not under any general obligation to air concerns about the evidence presented to it, even if the evidence is unchallenged. Um, and then I, I would just invite the court to read the extract from uh, Hassan, uh, both at the bottom of page 104 uh, and then over on page 105. Do you want us to read that now? I, I think I would, my lady. Certainly. Thought. 
then the only other passage from HA that I would uh, just deal with in, in the hearing, if I may, is at paragraph 31, um, Audrey makes the point, so page 110, um, Audrey says the part that's about uh, this is halfway through the fourth line, the parties can be taken to anticipate that the immigration judge will consider the contents of the documents, i.e. the evidence put forward, uh, and may attach significant to differences or inconsistencies which are be to be found there. The fact that such differences or inconsistencies were not raised during the hearing will not therefore usually result in unfairness. Uh, and that, in my submission, is really where we're at in this case. You've got the appellant putting forward documentary evidence which shows on a rational view, not necessarily the view that everyone would take, but a rational view what his earnings were and a, and the extent of the remittances. And the judge was entitled to find that that was not consistent with the case that he was making, namely that the money is all mine. It doesn't show what his earnings were, it shows what his profits were. Well, it's his evidence that he put forward as to his earnings. No, it wasn't. It, it, the Sorry, as to his profits. He said were five to six thousand a month. month. That was his evidence, according to the transcript. Uh, 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 it may not have been, uh, that, that was no doubt at the time of his appearance before the the tribunal, and the first uh, tribunal judge was looking at the 2021 period, and it may have differed from year to year, but, but that was the only evidence that the tribunal judge had as to earnings, as opposed to... Uh, as to receipts, yes. Um, the... I haven't dealt with the Ladin Marshall application, and I don't propose to deal with it. And you, I think you should have had a copy of the letter that was sent in uh, from GLD in response to the application. The points are made there. Um, the, the, point I, the, the only point I would make on this yes. is that this isn't a case, um, as with respect, as was suggested by my Lord just son earlier, where the, the role of the Court of Appeal is just to look at the first-tier tribunal. Uh, uh, because one can't simply step into the shoes of the upper tribunal in considering whether the first tier tribunal acted unfairly, where the evidential basis is then different, because the question for this court is obviously whether the upper tribunal was wrong. Uh, and my submission obviously is that the upper tribunal was not wrong, not only for, on the assumption that the points that were said not to be put weren't put, but also because it had no evidence and therefore couldn't get to that point. Uh, and putting in evidence in this court doesn't meet, doesn't retrospectively mean that the tribunal below was wrong on the basis of evidence that it didn't have. And so I appreciate that in the generality of cases where the evidential position doesn't change from the first tier tribunal, the upper tribunal, and then the court of appeal, obviously one is looking at the first tier tribunal's decision in almost every case, but, but where, where what is being said is that the uh, tribunal wasn't entitled to look at the fairness point because there was simply no evidence, one can't then Get around that in a review rather than a rehearing, and nobody's suggesting there should be a rehearing of what happened in the upper tribunal. Um, in, in in respect of that, but having said that, and, and I'll just rely on the, the letter from the government legal department in that respect. Um, if you're against me, as I suspect you may be, on the Land Marshall point, there are just some some aspects to the transcript which I would draw the, the court's attention to. Um, I've got hard copies if you don't have them to hand, but. Um, you have them. I think we have them. Thank you. So, if one looks to the bottom of page four, the judge says so. The, the the issue is about whether there is actually dependence, though. So, obviously, dependence is 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 what the judge says. The issues, the issue is the um, appellant's counsel says that's right. Well, the sentence in between then, Martha, that's in the Home Office's reviews letter, refusal, I yes. think, i.e. The, yes. the issue is the issue of dependence as framed by the refusal letter. Well, that, that's not how the tribunal would, as I've already de dealt with, that's not how the, tri the tribunal's not limited to the no, first that's what tribunal's the judge letter. saying to uh, Ms. Dewey this is just the, the sort of, introdu of, of, of what Ms. Dewey was invited to address at the hearing. This, this is just the introduction to the discussion, so it, 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 if there are other, other passages that may be more, more salient, but that's the, the judge is saying this is the issue, it's dependence. Yes. Um, uh, de de dependence uh, as defined by the refusal letter. One, 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 one needs to read all of that. This one, right? uh, I, I'm not inviting the, the court to ignore any of it. I, I'm just, um, if I may, just drawing out certain parts. Right. We then, over the page, um, 
the number of the appeal is the appellant's counsel. This is halfway down the page, um, just before Judge Bartlett says yes. Are the appellants financially dependent on the sponsor for their essential living needs? So this isn't just a question. It's obvious to counsel that represented the appellants that it wasn't just a question of whether or not uh, the essential living needs as opposed to other needs were being met, which is sometimes a question in these appeals. Um, and then we see Mr. Deary's helpfully put together the table of table of remittances. Um, and then on this really goes to ground two. I appreciate that um, Ms. Toll didn't, Mr. Toll didn't really deal with it orally, but I have to respond to, to it briefly. Um, the appellant's evidence on page eight, uh, which is about just, just above my first hole punch. Uh, no, I'm the only one that sends money to them. And just to clarify, how come you're the only one that sends money to them? They are, they all have children. My other siblings, they're all, they all take care of the children. For example, Hussein has five children, he works part time. So the question of who was the source of the money was asked about. There was no Home Office presenting officer there, there to, to say, you know, as they might, I put it to you that this money is in fact not from you. But it was ventilated. The issue of where this money came from was ventilated in the first tier tribunal. But the uh, question is, aside from you, does anyone else support them? So the, the issue was being put was not, are you sending the money, but are they getting some money from elsewhere, which is obviously relevant to defend them. But, but his that's, evidence that's was... That's not the point that arises in this appeal. The it? evidence was that he gave was no, that he was the only person that that sent the money, and that is ultimately what the judge rejected. It, the, the issue of who sends the money, or whose money it was, was raised, and, and, and his evidence was then rejected. And, and one sees, this is then in closing submissions at page 10, um, the key issue is whether the sponsor, this is uh, again about a quarter of the way down the page, um, the key issue is whether the sponsor uh, or rather where the appellants are financially dependent on the sponsor for their essential living needs. So again, we see that this point about whether the whether it's the sponsor on, on whom they're dependent it, it, it is squarely before the tribunal. But the whole focus in the refusal letters which framed this debate was we haven't got enough information from the purported dependents' point of view of what their expenses are and whether they are reliant on this money for their essential living needs. And that's what these questions are going to. Could they have got some money from someone else, apart from the money you sent? That's, that's not the point that arises in, in the appeal or the point that the judge decided the case on. It's, quite, it's a quite different point, isn't it? But the... one's, one's got to see this by reference to how Ms. Deary and um, how the sponsor would have uh, approached what, what they were being asked about, because your point is, oh no, it should have been obvious to them, they needed to deal with this tax return point. What they're being asked about essentially here is, apart from the money that you, the sponsor, are saving, are saving can, you, can, you, can we investigate whether dependence is, is proven, because they might have had sources elsewhere? The... Uh... I, I'm not sure that's quite right with respect, because the, the issue in the in the refusal letter was simply that we just don't have evidence, sufficient evidence to be able to be satisfied that you are providing them with enough money for or money for their essential living needs. So it, it wasn't there wasn't a question about whether or not the appellants were in receipt of other sources of funds. Uh, that was never that wasn't in the in the refusal letter. That was, that was the second bullet point in the refusal letter, wasn't it? Point one is sporadic. We haven't got enough records of you, the sponsor, making the payments. Point two, we'd expect to see much more information about your, your personal financial circumstances and, and so on in order to show that you're dependent. So, so that goes to the question of whether the money is being received for essential living needs. But that, that doesn't go to whether or not money is being received from... or doesn't necessarily go to whether money is being assessed, uh, received from somebody else. That goes to the, the use of the money that's being received. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I've obviously 
gone well out of turn from my five topics. Can I just take a moment? It's absolutely to... not your fault. No, no, no well, it's, that's the nature of, a, of an appeal. But um, can I just run through my speaking note and make sure I've covered it? Of course everything? you may. And, and please do take instructions. Uh, yeah, we'll do. Um... Sorry, oh, one sorry, moment. I'm doing my whispering while you were doing your whispering. <laughs> Sorry, just um, in relation to the cost and, and likewise of the transcript, my instructing solicitor's understanding, and I'm not going to put it any higher than that because we haven't double-checked it, is that you can apply for the recording, yes. you then pay for the transcriber. Sounds to transcri sensible. To transcri that means it sounds likely. Thank you. That's how uh, I'll be corrected if, if we're wrong, but that, that's, yeah, that's well, how that I Yeah, that would match the, the um, scenario in, in, in ordinary civil courts. Right. Um, I haven't yet gone through my notes. If, if I could no, just no, ask, do, court, bear with me do. one one moment. Do. Um, We're happy to sit a little over because no doubt there's not going to be a lot in reply in any of this. So just take your time and go through your notes. So there are just, I think, two two further points. Um, the first is just to respond on the respondent's notice ground to some of the points that my learned friend Mr Toll made, um, that the appellant could have asked for an adjournment mm -hmm. or that there was, alternatively, there was evidence before the tribunal. Um, the, the case law in the tribunal about when to grant an adjournment is that it's only appropriate to grant an adjournment where it would be unfair not to. It's a case called um, Nwagwe. It's about N-W-A-I-G-W-E. Um, where an appellant knows that they are required, in the absence of some express concession, to produce evidence of what happened, and they know that because of WN and the other cases that we've referred to, uh, then there is no unfairness in, if they turn up and say, well, I didn't know this point was coming, well, you, no, you haven't produced I, the evidence I'm sorry, required I'm still before. struggling to understand your position on this, and I'm sure it's my fault. Um, um, but the present scenario is one where the advocate who was present at the hearing is able to say, from her own knowledge, the point was not put. Now, unless someone comes forward to say, you're wrong, the point was put, and it's difficult in the present case to see how that could be done, because A, there was nobody there from the Home Office who could say that that was factually wrong, and B, if anybody had chosen to check the recording, they would have found that the advocate's statement was not incorrect, but correct. I, I'm struggling to understand what in your submission more is required. So the, the, it, it, there are, I'm not sure if it's in, in the bundle, there is a, a decision of Mr Justice McCloskey that makes it clear that in accordance with the, the normal rules in relation to professional conduct, an advocate cannot both be an advocate and a witness, and so it's normally we rely upon advocates who say the point was not put. It happens day in, day out in the courts. So in this context, the the authorities, as I've said, as I've well, in WA, and obviously I've shown you what, what's expected of an appellant, and 
uh, it may be in BW, but I think it's actually in a in a subsequent decision of Mr. Justice McCloskey. But um, that only arises once there's a, there's a dispute. Yes. There's, there's no the, there's no conflict until until, the, until there's a dispute. No, that's right. But this comes back to my point about concessions in this context having to be express, because until it's not that, a question of a concession. It's a question of the point was not put. So the question is whether there was a concession that the point was not put. Uh, and until th there's a dispute, at and, until, there's no dis until there's a concession as to that, it, it needs to, the appellant needs to prove that it wasn't put. Uh, and as WN shows, in the, in the tribunal context at least, that's, that's to be done by so, some so, sort of evidence. So, so as I understand it, and, and I'm grateful to you for clarification, what you're submitting is that even in the absence of any dispute, the burden is always on the advocate to prove by evidence in the form of a witness statement that the point was not put. No. Uh, I don't say anything about the form of evidence. That's the, the latter point. Okay. But the, 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 the point is that it's until it's conceded, it is always for the appellant to prove, as WN says, what happened before the first tier tribunal. And until there's a concession as to what happened before the first tier tribunal, that burden is on the appellant, or whoever it is, it would normally be an appellant to, who's arguing about what happened, to produce some evidence of it. Well, that, that's we, all. We, it's, we, uh, we haven't looked at the authorities about counsel giving evidence from the bar, of which there are a number of authorities, and my recollection is that that is, in some circumstances, appropriate. In practice, it's what happens all the time when the court asks counsel well, what happened below and they and they tell us and if it's not disputed that is evidence given by counsel at the bar as to what happened upon which the court proceeds it may not strictly speaking think oh, we're treating it evidence but it has to be treated as evidence if it's something on which the court can rely if i can just make two points in response to that the first is that one can't assume that this is a point that is always made by counsel that turns up uh, this is a jurisdiction in which litigants in person are regularly turning up in the upper tribunal to argue about what happened or didn't happen. And the same... Pre Precisely. Yes, that's, that's, that's why that's one relies upon the professional no, no, duties of counsel. And but, but the same process has to be put in place for, across the board. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. I'm sorry. Uh, if, if, if what happened in this case was that Miss Deary, with plenty of advance notice in the skeleton document, addressed the um, upper tribunal by asserting what had happened below. If that is not disputed, why is that not evidence given at the bar which can be treated as evidence on which the upper tribunal can proceed? Because, so my, my submission is that it's not not disputed until there's a concession, uh, and given that the Home Office wasn't before the first tier tribunal... No, no, this is in the upper tribunal I'm talking about. No, no, exactly, but the, so there wasn't... A concession and therefore it wasn't not disputed as to what happened in the first tier tribunal and given that the senior presenting officer in the upper tribunal a wasn't at, in the first tier tribunal and there was nobody whose notes could be looked at because there was nobody from the home office there the senior presenting officer wouldn't have been in a position to concede what happened so if, on your submission facts that are not disputed are nevertheless in issue unless they're formally conceded I'm not sure I understood the lot. So, so, so you, are, a, you are drawing a distinction time, between, gentlemen, between gentlemen. you're drawing a distinction between what is conceded and what is not disputed. No, I'm saying they're the same about. thing. Yes, you're saying that unless and until there's an, an, an explicit concession, the fact that there's no dispute is not enough. I, I'm saying that the fact that no positive case saying we don't accept that is not enough. But until there's a concession, I don't, I, I, it, this may be a linguistic issue, I, I, I wouldn't characterise it as not in dispute if a concession hasn't been made. It's, it's as WN shows, in this tribunal in, in the circumstances of the tribunal system, it's for an appellant to adduce some evidence. And until, um, until that evidence is adduced, I think it's Ortega, uh, I've quoted it in my, in my skeleton, the submission about unfairness simply doesn't get off the ground. What I was putting to you is that evidence was adduced in this case when Ms. Dury stood up and says this is what happened. I, I may need to um, 
if I may, uh, find this authority from Mr Justice McCloskey when he was president, because it very clearly makes, it, it sets out clearly the expectation in the tribunal that a, a, an advocate cannot simply say what happened below. They have to stop acting and put in a witness statement. Now that, of okay, course... You'll have to show me that, because if, if it's not disputed, that sounds to me to be both inconsistent with principle and productive of a huge amount of wasted cost and expense. I, I'm going to need a little. It may be that well, I just can, send that. Send us if the. If I may send it to you afterwards. Of course, you um, may. of course, I'll. Uh, yes. If Mr. Toll has anything to say about it, he, no, I have no objection. No, to well, I think so. we should look at it. So, yeah. if you could, of course, we'd be great. Now, you just had two points before you were bombarded with questions. Um, again. I, I think I may have dealt with them both. Uh, sorry, the two points were. Um, apologies. Um, let me go back to my note. The first was they could have asked for an adjournment point. I've dealt with that. Yes. But fairness didn't require it because it's well known mm -hmm. that it's for an appellant to reduce evidence of what happened yep. uh, and and they had that opportunity uh, and the second point that was made was uh, that there was evidence namely the entry clearance officer's decision well that doesn't evidence what happened before the first tier tribunal um, the appellant's skeleton argument well that's not evidence that's council submissions and the first tier tribunal determination now of course the first tier tribunal determination is evidence of what happened before it but there's in a case where what you're saying is something wasn't put, there's lots of things that are said in a tribunal to, in, in a tribunal hearing that aren't going to be recorded in a determination. And, and so it, it, in my submission, that the tribunal's absence of uh, saying, well, I didn't put this, is not, is not evidence that it, that it wasn't put. Um, and just, just then briefly, if I may, to deal with ground two, uh, in my submission, ground two adds nothing because either you're with the appellant on fairness, and it all needs to go back, uh, or you're not. And if it was a fair hearing, then the appellant's case was, it's all, they're just dependent on me. It can't in the circumstances where it wasn't raised with the judge, uh, that if, if, it, if, if you don't find that it's all money coming from me, or it's money coming from somebody, you know, partly from me, partly from somebody else, this just wasn't an issue before the first tribunal. Um, the, the appellant's case was, or rather the sponsor's case, I suppose, evidence, was it's all my money. Uh, that was rejected. That's the, that's the answer to, to ground two with respect. So I, 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 with, I don't think ground two adds anything unless... I, I understand that in, entirely. It might, it might cast some light on ground one in this sense, that if, as, as you submit, the first tier tribunal's finding was indeed that none of the money came from the sponsor, uh, then uh, that is... Uh, hard to reconcile as a matter of logic with the, the reasoning so because uh, if, if one's dealing with 127 pounds or thereabouts one can see one can see the logic of what the judge was getting at if what actually um, uh, she found was that the whole of the money didn't come from him then uh, the numbers don't don't make that point so can I just, um, it's perhaps completely pedantic, so apologies if it's unnecessary, but there is a, a difference between her having fact, I appreciate in the binary system of fact finding, it may not in fact make a difference in reality, but the, there is a difference between finding that he hasn't proved that he was the source of the money, and therefore the default is then that he isn't the source of the money, and a positive finding that the money came from somebody else. And the judge didn't need to go as far as the second, the judge just needed to find that he hadn't proved that he was the source of the money. So I appreciate that the way that works is that one, one then assumes that he isn't the source of the money, but he doesn't. it doesn't follow from that, that in finding that he hasn't proved that he is the source of any of the money, the judge then had to go on to consider whether or not he was the source of some of it. That, that is ground two, and I understand what you're saying, but, but in, in the context of ground one, the, 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 the maths, as it were, doesn't doesn't actually establish that he couldn't be the source of any of the money or sufficient of the money to establish dependency. I, I, I mean, this is a this is a new point really that's been raised by by the court today about about the whether the inference that was drawn was one that was rationally entitled to be drawn by the judge. Um, it's not said that that's uh, putting aside the fairness point. It's not as assuming for present, for just for the sake of argument, that it was a fair no, process. I'm not putting it on rationality basis, but it's perhaps an illustration of 
how it would have been all the more important for the matter to have been raised expressly, because dealing with the point would have involved not only looking at other sources for his income, what his explanation was for a figure of £127, uh, but also potentially whether um, part would have been sufficient to establish dependency. I, I suppose my answer to that is, is something I've said several times already today, which is it was for the appellant to prove that he was he was the source of the money, whether it be all of it or some of it, and his case was he's the source of all of it, and it was that case that was rejected. Um, I, the, the, I, I, I hear what the court is saying, or what your worship is saying, in relation to the, the possible impact of putting the question, but it comes back to my submission that it isn't for the court to, to, to roll its sleeves up and start cross-examining. It's, it's for the appellant to prove, appellants to prove their case. Uh, 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 that, that's really the, the number of, number of it. Um, uh, um, you know, I, I, I think I've answered that question now from, from yes, different angles, yes. uh, uh, both physical obvious. and, um, well, yeah. Yes, yes, thank uh, you. Uh, uh, and obviousness in this context has to be assessed by reference to the issues that are to be proved by an appellant. I mean, that probably goes without saying. Um, unless there's anything. Ah, the, the, sorry. The case um, on oh, that's with, on thank, a, you. thank you very much. Um, is it's called B W. Uh, sorry, B W. B, and it, that is actually in the bundle. But it's not. It's not this one actually. I'll, I'll, no. Thank you. Though. Um, I'll find it and send but it. Tab um, sixteen, I think. B W. BW is at tab sixteen. But it's not. It's, a, it's not that one. It's another McCloskey decision. Mr. Justice McCloskey's decision. Um, uh, on, on, on a sim but we'll, we'll see it when you send um, through the citation for us. Thank you. Yeah, um, and unless I can assist any further, no, they, you've they been extremely help. helpful. Well, and I've extremely got, patient. I'm sorry. I've oh no, two, I've, got two, I've got two very slow balls, which are, uh, <laughs> uh, you'll be able to answer easy. Um, first, just can you confirm that we should deal with the case without distinguishing between the three appellants, so that although the refusal yes, letter... Yes, sorry, yes, I, I agree with that. Um, the, the position that was taken in the first tribunal was eminently sensible, that there were substantive reasons and there were procedural reasons. The procedural reasons, I think, were conceded by the, the Home Office at the appeal, and so it's just the substantive reasons that were that were an issue. Thank you. Thank you. And then um, the, there seems to be some doubt about who the proper respondent is, whether it's the Secretary of State it's or whether it's the Entry Clearance Officer. Clearance officer. Um, I, can you just explain to us why? I'm, I'm right. not doubting what you it's, say, I'm um, just puzzled I, I, as to why. So I may not be able to give you chapter and verse, but the headline point is that the uh, functions are, uh, the, st the statutory functions of granting entry clearance are assigned by statute to entry clearance officers, whereas the function of granting leave to remain or indefinite leave to remain, etc., is grant is is uh, a function that's uh, that's allocated by primary legislation okay. to the Secretary of State. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thank that, you. That's that's the uh, that's as I understand it. And Mr. Toll's been in the business longer than I have, but I think that's that's the the right Thank the you. right point. Uh, can I just deal with um, remedy if I lose? Yes. Um, I think we agree that it should go back to the first tier tribunal because obviously we should it have was unfair. It, but I think we all presumed that would no, be. No, but I just thought make it make it express. Just Thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. Now, um, Mr. Till, are you going to be brief or, or should we adjourn now till two o'clock? Well, then, you know, that's a hard question to answer because I've heard a lot it, with which I disagree. Given the input from this court, I'm not surprised you find it hard to answer. <laughs> I mean, but bear in mind you don't need to repeat what you already said in opening the appeal. Um, I, if I could just try to reply briefly. I don't um, want to put any pressure on you. I realise how important this is for, for, for all the parties involved. Um, if you'd prefer to wait till two, two o'clock, I don't think any of us are back in court this afternoon on other business. And we will, of course, um, rise till two if you want to take a little time to regroup. If, if, if that's OK with the court, I think I would prefer that. And I would hope to be... Very well. All right. Thank you very much. Um, it, it, does it give everyone enough time if we do say we will come back at two, even though it's already ten past one? Is that all right? That's not going to inconvenience anyone. No? Nope. Very well. Thank you very much. Court rise if able.